On April 1st of this year, 2023, it will be three years since I published my controversial four-and-a-half-hour presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? Based on the research I presented back in April of 2020, I concluded the Beatles did not write all their own music and did not play on all their recorded tracks. As of this recording, across all of my platforms, the presentation has achieved over 150,000 views worldwide. Since the publishing of the presentation, I have presented additional information and evidence which I believe strengthens my conclusion that the Beatles did not write all their own songs. The clues are embedded within the Beatles' official narrative, and once you become aware of what to look for, it becomes easier to discern and recognize the true story that is hidden in plain sight. The Beatles' exponential rise in fame and popularity from when they signed their contract with EMI in June of 1962, through the release of their seventh album, Revolver, in August of 1966, was a phenomenal success story. But was their rise to fame and prominence real? Or were the Beatles an engineered entity, created by the social scientists of Tavistock, to social engineer the world into a different mindset and system of values? Starting in August of 1960, when the Beatles first arrived in Hamburg, Germany, as a young and inexperienced band, through their DECA audition on January 1st of 1962, and then with the signing of their contract with EMI in June of that year, the Beatles were known as a bar and club band whose repertoire consisted of cover songs. In a number of interviews, George Martin's own assessment of the band's songwriting and musical skills were less than flattering. As we will hear later in this presentation, George Martin tells us the band showed no indication of songwriting prowess and he thought their music was, quote, rubbish. In fact, what many Beatle fans don't know is George Martin, upon listening to the tapes played for him by Brian Epstein in early 1962, initially declined to sign the Beatles, just as Decca declined back in January of the same year. Then, as the memoirs of Billy Shears explains, George Martin was instructed to take the band on, even though, according to Martin, quote, they had nothing behind them. So right from the start, there appeared to be a plan for the Beatles that resulted in the band signing with EMI with George Martin as their producer. Later, we will take a look into the 1960-1963 through 1963 period to understand what was going on behind the scenes to move the Beatles from a nondescript, marginally skilled band in August of 1960 to becoming a worldwide phenomenon in a mere three and a half years when they landed in America on February 7, 1964. The evolution of the Beatles' music from 1963 through 1966, starting with their first UK album, Please Please Me, through Revolver, was quite remarkable. Even the mainstream narrative explains the Beatles' songwriting abilities evolved significantly in both complexity and sophistication in less than four years. Given the backstory of the Beatles being a bar and club band that specialized in cover music, I had to ask, is this a natural progression? Or is there more to the story? So Brian then had this tape, which he hawked around. And I think it was somebody in the HMV shop on Oxford Street mm. knew George Martin and told Brian to go and play the tape to George Martin. And then he gave us the audition at um, Abbey Road. What I said to Brian was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. And he was so disappointed. I felt really sorry for him, actually, because he an earnest young man. And you must, you must have liked him, then? I did, I did like him. And I, I said, but I tell you what, I gave him a lifeline. I said, if you want to bring them down from Liverpool, I'll give them an hour in the studio, OK? George had done little of uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in a studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I couldn't make out the sound, you know, it was something I hadn't heard before. So there's there's they had this wonderful charisma. They, they made you feel good to be with them. Mm. And uh, I thought their music was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Even though they had uh, nothing really behind them, they were still fairly irreverent, even in those days, which I, which I loved. You know, I, I, I like a little bit of rebel in people, and I like their sense of humour. Uh, after all, that was my main stock in trade, too. And I guess they quite liked what I've been doing with Peter Sellers and the Goons and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I looked at these four guys and thought, well, none of them shines as being above all the others. And I had to make up my mind, in my silly mind, who the lead singer was going to be. Suddenly I realized I would take them as they were, as a group. The hell with a lead singer. They would be singing together. So we were struggling with the sound a bit. And I said to the boys, after we'd done a few takes of rather nondescript songs, I said, come into the control room and have a listen and see what we've been doing. And uh, if there's anything you don't like, tell us. I was looking for something original because I didn't want to do one of the oldies that they've been doing as part of their act. And Love Me Do was the best song that they, I could find from them at that time. I was very conscious that it wasn't the, the big hit I was looking for. I spent a few hours with them in Abbey Road and fell in love with them because they had great charisma. They certainly had no, uh, no didn't, it, was, it wasn't at all obvious that they could be songwriters at this stage, but their songs were pretty awful. Awesome. Even then, Love Me Do was the best thing. Back on August 5th, 1966, the same day the Beatles released Revolver, which was their seventh UK studio album, Paul and John sat down with the BBC for an interview. At the time of my April 2020 presentation, I was not aware of the interview. However, I did present it back in November of last year as part of a larger presentation titled We're Not All That Good Musically. It is a very important interview. In fact, I consider it to be a smoking gun because Paul and John, especially Paul, explain exactly when the Beatles allegedly wrote their music. We are told they did not write between albums, which means they were not writing songs during the time periods when they were performing live, touring, or on holiday. They wrote their songs in, quote, batches, whenever they had an album or film coming up, which parallels the Rubber Soul narrative, where the Beatles came into the sessions with no backlog of music and had to write, rehearse, and record 16 songs in 30 days. The August 1966 BBC interview came across to me as Paul and John dropping clues as to the true nature of how the songwriting worked within the Beatles' machine. I found their version of the story to be very different from that of the official narrative. The admission by Paul and John in the BBC interview validated my assumptions from Chapter 3 of my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? In Chapter 3, without the knowledge of the BBC interview, I set out to categorize and then assess, at a high level, if activities such as ongoing live performances and touring filming movies, and recording schedules were conducive to the songwriting process. The initial assessment from Chapter 3 presented more questions than answers, and so I concluded a deeper dive was necessary to try to fully understand what was going on. As I explained in my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music?, and in many other interviews and videos, my interest in questioning the Beatles' official narrative around the writing of their music was piqued when I purchased and watched a DVD titled Deconstructing the Beatles' Rubber Soul. Within 20 minutes of watching the documentary and learning the Beatles entered the Rubber Soul sessions on October 11, 1965 with essentially no backlog of music and were then tasked to write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 songs by November 11th raised a red flag. I asked myself the question, how feasible is it that the Beatles, specifically John and Paul, could write from scratch, rehearse, and record 16 songs within 30 days. Being a musician and songwriter myself, who was familiar with the recording process, I began questioning the narrative. The making of my April 2020 presentation took seven months to complete, and there was a huge amount of data that I needed to sort through, organize, and analyze. The purpose of the Chapter 3 charts was to start building the initial framework for a first round of analysis. By creating the categories to capture activities involving album recording periods, live performances, and film dates, it helped to assess, again at a high level, where the Beatles may have spent their time, 
In the presentation, I explained the categorization of the data was not an exact science, but an exercise to start the process of analyzing. In other words, it was a starting point in which to build upon and then decide if the initial analysis supported a deeper dive. I concluded it did, based on what appeared to be an issue with time compression or lack of time. Chapter 3 starts with the assumption that the Beatles wrote and recorded their own music because that is what the official narrative tells us. For the purposes of illustration, as I talk to this slide, I will focus on the Beatles' second UK album release, With the Beatles. We can see the recording period to produce With the Beatles was 97 days, beginning on July 18th of 1963 and concluding on October 23rd. It's important to understand that 97 days to record or make the album does not imply the Beatles were physically at the studio all those days. The number of days is a reflection of the total elapsed time from start to finish to produce an album because it represents the full range of studio activities up through the final mix down and cutting of the lacquer. For example, although the Beatles were not recording every single day during the Rubber Soul time frame, which was explained in my April 2020 presentation on slide 114, the entirety of the Rubber Soul recording sessions did span 37 days when we factor in the full range of studio activities such as writing, rehearsing, arranging, editing, mixing, and finalizing the lacquer, which begins the process of pressing the vinyl records. It's key to understand the Beatles' time in the studio for Rubber Soul was not just a recording exercise. At a minimum, they had to write the songs and then rehearse them before the songs were ready to be recorded. Since there is more to making a record than the band's physical presence in the studio, the number of days between the recording start and finish dates represents the elapsed number of days to complete the album. For example, the official narrative tells us the Beatles spent seven days in the studio recording with the Beatles. However, when factoring in all of the studio activity required to create an album, it did take 97 days to create with the Beatles, even if there were periods of time within the 97 days when no recording or studio activity was scheduled or took place. To illustrate, suppose you have a house being built and construction begins on January 1st and concludes on June 30th. If someone asked you how much time did it take to build your house, you would say 180 days or 6 months. Does this imply that building activity took place every day for the 180 days? No, of course not. There would have been times when construction activity may have been idle, for example, for holidays or weekends, or delayed due to availability of supplies such as lumber, bricks, concrete, siding, shingles, flooring, etc., as well as the availability of contractors responsible for framing, roofing, electrical work, and plumbing. Now apply this example to the making of an album. It's the same premise. Because the official narrative does not specify the Beatles recorded on certain days, does not mean they were not rehearsing or attending to other studio activities between July 18th and October 23rd for With the Beatles. When we consider 97 days is approximately three months, that is not a long time, by any stretch, to complete an album of 14 songs. So, from an assumption perspective, why would we not assume the Beatles were actively involved in the making of the album over the three-month period? This is especially true if the songs were not already written coming into the sessions. This would mean many of the songs, if not all of them, would have to be written, rehearsed, arranged, and recorded in the studio within the recording time period, a challenging if not daunting task similar to the Rubber Soul narrative. So the assumption I made, and I believe it to be prudent, was the Beatles were involved for a good portion of the time during the making of their albums. Why would we expect anything less from the greatest rock band in history? The key is to understand the physical act of recording on specific days is one component of the overall process to produce an album. Other activities, such as writing, if a band is writing in the studio, rehearsal, arranging, overdubs, editing, mixing, and the band's overall personal involvement are all part of the process that needs to be factored into the length of time it takes to produce an album. There's more to the recording process than pressing the record button. After I factored in other events that were contained within the recording dates of a particular album, for example, live gigs which overlap the recording period, as well as the making of their two films, A Hard Day's Night in Help, 
coupled with activities outside an album's recording timeline, such as their live performances, tours, and other personal or business activities, suggested to me, again, that time compression was an issue regarding available time to write music. And when we get to the August 1966 BBC interview, we will see my suspicions were justified. If we take the prior chart, where the recording start to finish dates were stated in days, and convert the days to months, we gain a different perspective. We can then assess the number of months it took to produce an album against average cycle times to make a record. It's interesting to note that the making of the Hard Day's Night and Help albums, along with the filming of the respective movies, where the filming dates were contained within the album's start-to-finish dates, span the same amount of time of four months. Setting aside Please Please Me, which is a quirky narrative, where we are told 10 of the album's 14 songs were recorded in a single session on February 11, 1963, each of the remaining six albums took no more than approximately four months to make. We can also see that to produce all seven albums released between 1963 and 1966 only took a year and a half. The Beatles' first seven albums resulted in 97 recorded tracks, of which 77 were original compositions. There were also 13 original singles released on the Parlophone label during this period, of which five were not album tracks. From the website Music Industry How To, we are told, in general terms, you'll see artists work for several months to a couple of years on a record, finish it, spend six months setting up the release, and then ride on that album for around two years. Those two years will include heavy touring, lots of press, album promo, and creative work on a new record. Although cycle times to record and produce an album will vary widely, remember, we're looking at an average, the cycle time for the Beatles albums, from start to finish, does not appear unreasonable, especially for the 1960s era of record production. Another data set from Chapter 3 was Column 7, where I presented the live performance and touring days, which were sourced from Wikipedia. I will leave the link in the description box below. Because the April 2020 presentation focused on the Beatles' official UK albums, I set 1962 as the starting point because it led into the release of the Beatles' first UK album, Please Please Me. However, the Beatles' live gigs started in earnest back in 1961, with worldwide touring beginning with their 1964 world tour. We should also remember that along with performing live, the Beatles were also doing their BBC performances starting in March of 1962 through May of 1965. Their performances were a constant, ongoing stream of activity between 1961 and 1963 before shifting to touring in 64. In the complete Beatles documentary from 1982, we are told in 1964 alone, the Beatles played in over 50 cities on four continents and touring had become intolerable. This type of schedule had to be exhaustive and therefore presented another constraint which could potentially interfere with available time to write music. The girls still screamed, but the excitement was gone. Touring had become intolerable. And it became a terrible prison for them because um, all they could do was to go to the concert and then go back to their hotel room and be locked in. They had no life at all, they were just the four of them, and no one knows what kind of a life it was except those four themselves. Not even Brian or I knew really all the problems they had to go through when they were on tour. It's a bit hard when you get up first thing in the morning and you travel all day. You get to a hotel and there's thousands of people outside. You're out in your bedroom. So how they came through, I just don't know. Realization, you know, was really kicking in that nobody was listening, and that was okay at the beginning. But even worse than that is we were playing so bad. I mean, I was playing just shit, and uh, all I could do was like just hold down the, the offbeat because you know I couldn't come off that really uh, because you know if you went to do anything on the toms, it just was like went into nothing. You know, you go, mm -ga, mm -ga. <laughs> That's no noise. And you just, you know, I just felt, you know, we're playing really bad. 
How did you spend your time outside the club when you were basically through working? What'd you do? Well, by the time we'd finished working, in those days we used to work eight hours a night. We'd start at six and finish at two in the morning during right. the week. What'd you do before? In other words, your basic time for enjoying yourself was mm -hmm. before and maybe a little uh, after, but mo most of the time before. What did you do before, before you went into the club? Well, by the time we'd woken up, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, great. Now that you had, you know, all sorts of time. You had mm -hmm. two hours to do what? Yeah, well... You walk around and you see the rest of Hamburg? Yeah, well, we, you know, the first time we were there, we were like, as well as being musicians, we How were How did tourists. people take, take you when you walked around? you walk around in black leather jackets? Uh, after about a month, we walked around in black leather people jackets. People stare at you all the time? Oh, yeah, all the time. To prepare to play live, whether it be locally, within the UK, or elsewhere, there had to be rehearsal, travel, setup, etc., not to mention eating, sleeping, and attending to other life activities outside of music, especially as four young men, which will take us to Hamburg in a moment. In other words, a band does not simply show up to a gig and play without learning songs and rehearsing. It's not a matter of arriving, playing for an hour or two, and then having the rest of the day to studiously write songs. There is an entire set of activities associated with being a band and playing live that needs to be factored into the time equation. In Hamburg, the Beatles were at the clubs several hours a night for weeks at a time, enduring substandard accommodations, which some might even call deplorable. In the book Lenin Prophecy, author Joseph Nisgoda explains, in August of 1960, the Beatles began playing a 48-night run at Hamburg's Indra Club, their first professional bookings as the Beatles. The club was located near the Reeperbahn, an urban hell, the city's red light district, an area rife with strip clubs, sex shops, harlots, crooks, drugs, and numerous drinking establishments. The band was lodging in conditions that biographer Barry Miles describes as appalling. The Beatles slept in the dressing rooms of a run-down former cinema and bathed in its restrooms, and the situation didn't get any classier. The Beatles took full advantage of the lifestyle, drinking and spending their money as quickly as they were paid. They had at their call many of the local girls and prostitutes, which came with its problems. The boys were treated often for sexually transmitted diseases. By December, the Beatles returned home broke, dejected, and dispirited, their future as a band uncertain. The book goes on to say that Paul did nothing but laze around the house with his father constantly pushing him to get a job while John spent vacant hours home alone. I'm going to guess that not a lot of original music was being created during their Hamburg gigs. Later in the presentation, we will talk more about the 1960 through 1963 timeline. This is a version of a slide from my April 2020 presentation that describes the typical songwriting process leading into recording a song. It's important to note that in many cases, a songwriter will write a few songs in order to get to one which they consider worthy of recording. Although writing songs spontaneously or quickly can happen, it is not the norm. In general, writing songs, especially good ones like many of the Beatles' music, takes time. Songwriting, as one would assume, is a creative process. Sometimes the music comes first, and other times it might be the lyrics or even just a melody that comes into your awareness. This then leads to writing the structure of the song, which would include the verse, bridge, and chorus. Once the initial structure of the song is created, you have a draft or a demo of that song. It's not uncommon to continue to work on the draft or demo until you believe you have a completed version. Many times, songwriters will write songs either partially or completely and then decide to shelve the song either temporarily or permanently if they feel it's not resonating with them. However, if the song is deemed worthy, then the songwriter will present the song to their band members or collaborators. Introducing a song to the band can result in additional changes and usually does. After rehearsing the song, which in itself is a collaborative process where more changes can be made, the song is then ready to be recorded. The first set of tracks to be recorded would be the basic rhythm tracks, which typically include the rhythm guitar, bass, and drums. The recording of the basic rhythm tracks can result in multiple takes to finalize the tracks. Finalizing the basic tracks may also involve editing, where the best of multiple takes are stitched together or edited to create the final version. After the basic tracks are finalized, the overdubs are done. The overdubs would include vocals, keyboards, lead guitar, etc. Once all of the tracks for the song are recorded, edited, and finalized, the song is then mixed down to adjust individual tracks for volume, effects, fading, etc. Once the final mix is completed, 
this song is mastered. Mastering is the process of bringing out the final presence of the song by adjusting decibel levels, equalization, compression, and so on. Back in the day of vinyl records, once the song is mastered, a lacquer is created and finalized to start the process of record pressing. As all of this is happening, the album art, record sleeves, and labels are created and sent out to be printed. It should also be noted the ink to create the artwork required a week to dry. With the record now pressed and the labels and album sleeves completed, the record is now ready to be packaged and staged for distribution. When I play the August 1966 interview with John and Paul, you will get a sense that even for the Beatles, assuming for the sake of argument that they did write their own songs, that songwriting was a process that took time. Some people who dislike the questioning of the Beatles' narrative like to point to mainstream interviews of artists who tell stories of how their songs magically came together. What the official story believers fail to understand is the music industry is entertainment and the artists they idolize are performers. They are the veneer in front of the curtain. Part of their responsibilities as a performer is to embellish stories in order to optimize the entertainment value of their particular narrative. For example, in the Muscle Shoals documentary from 2013, we are told the Rolling Stones recorded three songs in the studio within two to three days for their Sticky Fingers album. One of those songs was Wild Horses, along with Brown Sugar and You Gotta Move, which was a cover. In the documentary, Mick Jagger states, Keith Richards may have had only the chorus written for Wild Horses, while Keith Richards said the song was an idea. In either case, whether there was a chorus for the song or it was just an idea, the song was mostly unwritten. Keith Richards then goes on to say he wrote Wild Horses, essentially from scratch, in the restroom of the Muscle Shoals studio. The thing is, once Keith finished writing the song, he still needed to go through the process I just described. He had to present the song to his bandmates, make adjustments to the song based on band input, and then rehearse the song to get it down and ready to record. As Wild Horses was being worked on, the Stones still had two other songs to record during their three-day stint at the studio. Two to three days in the studio is a flyover. Thus, for those who are familiar with the songwriting and recording process, the narrative in the documentary regarding the origins of Wild Horses is suspect at best. Adding to the song's questionable storyline is the long-held premise that Wild Horses was actually written by Graham Parsons. In the liner notes to the 1993 Rolling Stones compilation album Jump Back, Mick Jagger states, quote, I remember we sat around originally doing this, meaning Wild Horses, with Graham Parsons, and I think his version came out slightly before ours, end quote. It's important to understand the music business is, first and foremost, entertainment, and not necessarily focused on presenting the truth. Although it's possible to write songs during recording sessions, while on tour, or on a movie set, generally speaking, it is not an environment that is conducive to the songwriting process. Songs are typically written and well rehearsed before entering the recording studio. This is because time is money. Well rehearsed bands reduce studio time and associated costs. Using the studio to write, rehearse, and then record can be an expensive proposition and there is no such thing as free studio time. At a minimum, salaries and overhead costs are incurred in the form of producers, engineers, recording staff, writers, session players, equipment maintenance, etc. Touring and playing live usually means traveling by plane and or bus from city to city or country to country and living out of hotels. It's an environment that is not very inviting to the creative process. Writing music while making a movie is also a challenging scenario, since the band's focus is on learning the script, memorizing lines, and rehearsal, while the director of the film is operating within a defined schedule and budget. To put context around whether the Beatles were writing songs during the filming of A Hard Day's Night in Help, let's read what John Lennon had to say from a February 2020 independent article regarding the Beatles indulging in pills and weed. From the article, On a hard day's night, I was on pills. The only way to survive in Hamburg, to play eight hours a night, was to take pills. Help was where we turned on to pot. We were smoking marijuana for breakfast during that period. Nobody could communicate with us. It was all glazed eyes and giggling all the time, in our own world. It's like doing nothing most of the time, but still having to rise at 7 a.m., so we became bored. 
Dick Lesser knew that very little would get done after lunch. In the afternoon, we very seldom got past the first line of the script. We had such hysterics that no one could do anything. John Lennon's quotes are very telling, so we need to ask a reasonable question. Does a steady state of being stoned spark songwriting creativity, especially after John explains they seldom got past the first line of the script and they had such hysterics that no one could do anything? Based on John's own words, I concluded the lads were not writing a lot of music when they were on the film sets. As I analyzed the data from Chapter 3 of my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music?, I needed to discern what was possible versus what is probable. Probable implies that there is a very high chance or a likelihood that a certain event might occur. On the other hand, possible means something may or may not happen and the outcome, in the case of possibility, is uncertain. For example, if there is a 10% chance of rain today, it is possible it will rain, but it also means there is a 90% chance that it will not rain. On the other hand, if there's a 90% chance of rain today, it is probable, meaning it is likely, it will rain. So I set out to assess the probability or likelihood that songwriting took place in parallel with other significant activities and asked the following question. How likely is it that John and Paul were writing, rehearsing, and recording songs during the recording period of an album or during the filming of their movies or along the timeline of their live performance and touring schedule? I determined that although it was possible, it was unlikely any meaningful songwriting and rehearsing was getting done. Recording sessions have deadlines which culminate to a release date. Entering the studio with little to no backlog of songs is a very risky strategy because if the 12 to 14 songs the Beatles were on the hook for don't get written and recorded within the established schedule, then no record gets released and the record company is out not only the costs associated with the sessions, but also revenue, since the album would either be delayed or worse, not released. Another important factor is this. EMI had an extensive portfolio of artists on their roster that EMI producers needed to book sessions for who were under contract to record and release their own records. Although the Beatles were a huge act for the label, they were certainly not the only artists making money for the company. So I thought it was logical to assume that most of the music would have been written prior to the start of the recording sessions. But the question I had was this. With all the other activity they were involved in, when were they able to write and rehearse? Per the independent article I discussed on the previous slide, John Lennon explained he was popping pills in Hamburg and on the set of A Hard Day's Night, and the entire band was in a haze of marijuana and high during the filming of Help, with John adding they were pretty much useless after lunch. And the official Beatles story tells us the constant performing and tours were extremely hectic and exhausting. So it appeared unlikely John and Paul were writing their songs in the studio, on film sets, or during periods when they were on the road performing live and touring. Therefore, after analyzing the time around their performance schedule, films, and recording dates, I determined something was off. If time was an issue, and I believed it was, then when were John and Paul able to prolifically write their songs? So I decided a deeper dive was required in order to fully understand what was really going on. That deeper dive resulted in researching deep state entities such as the Committee of 300 and Tavistock, along with learning more about social engineers such as Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon, who had their ideology grounded in the human potential movement, which played a significant role in the counterculture of the 1960s, which became known as the Aquarian Conspiracy. Of the big presentation's four-and-a-half-hour runtime, four hours, or almost 90%, went beyond Chapter 3 as part of the deep dive. Thus, Chapter 3 was a starting point to test the waters to decide if there was possibly more to the Beatles story. I decided the answer was yes, a lot more. As I mentioned earlier, back when I was working on the April 2020 presentation, I had not yet come across the BBC interview that Paul and John did on August 5, 1966, which, by the way, was the same day Revolver was released. The BBC released the interview on August 29th, which coincided with the Beatles' very last live performance at Candlestick Park. Both dates are interesting in that they mark pivotal moments along the Beatles' timeline. As a side note, 
The set list for the Beatles' last concert tour consisted of 18 shows performed between August 12th and August 29th of 1966 and did not contain one song from their newly released Revolver album. So with the Beatles fresh out of the studio with a brand new album, not one track from the record was performed live. Why would that be? Perhaps it was because they had not learned to play the songs on the album and so they resorted to performing older material, including two covers during that tour, Rock and Roll Music and Long Tall Sally. During the BBC interview, Paul and John answered many of the questions I was seeking answers to. For example, when exactly did they do most of their writing? After listening to the interview, it seemed as if John and Paul were intentionally dropping clues to reveal the truth. John and Paul had written at least a 100 songs together since they met in 1956. But they hadn't recorded any, original or otherwise. Not until they went to Hamburg again in 1960 did they make their first record. And then only as a backup group for their friend Tony Sheridan. The result? An awkward rock and roll arrangement of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. On August 5th, 1966, John and Paul did an interview with the BBC at Paul's home. The full interview is approximately 25 minutes in length and the link is in the description box below. Of the 25 minutes, there is approximately six minutes of the discussion which intrigued me because within the overall conversation, it appeared to me that Paul and John, but Paul in particular, was exposing the truth about the true nature of the Beatles' songwriting. Some might refer to it as revelation of the method. In a moment, I will play excerpts from the interview, but before I do, let me call out the highlights we should listen for. When John is asked whether he is more focused on being a group or a songwriter, he says his focus is more on being a group. Then when John is asked about when he became a songwriter, he states he cannot remember, when the official narrative tells us that both John and Paul wrote 100 songs between them from 1956 through 1962. Then Paul discusses how songwriting is a process versus an on-demand or spontaneous activity. When John is asked by the interviewer, if he is the words person, he states no and explains he finds it equally hard whether he's writing music or coming up with lyrics. Paul then says something very important. He states, the only time they need to force themselves to write songs is when an album or film comes up. This is very much like the Rubber Soul model, where the songs for the album were allegedly written in the studio during the actual recording sessions. Paul then says the songwriting process is a bit of a drag for the first two songs. And with the last LP, referring to Revolver, he comments it took weeks to get one song written. Then Paul drops a bombshell by saying, We don't write between LPs normally, maybe one or two. Then we write a great big batch. With this statement, Paul completely eliminates the argument that the Beatles were writing in between albums, meaning they were not writing songs during their live performance schedules on holiday, or in parallel with any other activity that was not studio or film-based. He is clearly saying that aside from maybe one or two songs, their writing was exclusive to when they needed to record an album, which was twice a year between 1963 and 1965. The BBC interviewer then questions the feasibility of writing 12 songs for an album in what Paul referred to as batches, with John saying, it is some days, meaning it's a challenge, and then adding, writing songs was at times very impossible. Then John and Paul discuss their lack of motivation to write when on holiday. When they talk about being on holiday, I believe they are referring to the period of time they had off after returning home from a major tour. For example, before the Rubber Soul sessions began on October 11, 1965, the Beatles had a six-week break after completing their 1965 U.S. tour. Even though the official narrative explains the Beatles came into the Rubber Soul sessions with essentially no backlog of songs and needed to write from scratch, there are people that still want to argue that the Beatles did write during that six-week break, even though the mainstream narrative tells us that did not happen. But with this interview, John and Paul settle the debate by explaining it was not a time when they were motivated to write songs. Paul then acknowledges the use of session players and the bigger lineup available to George Martin and says the problem with session players is everything needs to be written down. 
Paul then uses the example of why session players, although technically good, have their drawbacks because if the Beatles wanted a guitar note to bend, they would simply tell George Harrison what they wanted because Paul claims there is no way to annotate a bend for a studio player, which is incorrect. Note bending can absolutely be annotated. Then Paul drops another bomb by stating, we're limited as a group. We're the first to say we're not all that good musically. And then he admits he did not play on Yesterday, when the official narrative clearly credits Paul for the acoustic guitar track on the song. Let's now take a listen to these segments of the interview, and then I will play a video where Beatles author Philip Norman explains how George Harrison was treated in the studio, and in my opinion, offers additional insight into how things really worked behind closed doors. And as far as Philip Norman's take on the importance of George bringing this sitar into the studio, I believe the sitar work was performed by a studio player like Big Jim Sullivan, who was one of the most in-demand studio musicians in the UK and who also spent time visiting George Harrison at George's home. I think it's very possible Big Jim was tutoring George on the instrument. Big Jim released two sitar-based albums back in the late 1960s. Now let's take a moment and listen to the BBC interview from August 5th, 1966. John, when you started out and, and, and became the Beatles as a group, you were then writing songs with Paul. Did you at that time have as your goal, your ambition to be a successful group, or did you really think it was songwriting that mattered? Uh, it, was, it was the group thing mainly at first. Because uh, anyway, to get sell the songs, you, you can't sort of get... You know, you've got to send them to some little publisher otherwise. You know, who never looks at them. So we, we, all, we always concentrated on the group, really. Did you at any one stage come to the point where you said, heavens above, we're, we're successful as composers and we shall be more successful as composers than we'll ever be as musicians? I can't well, remember a point, but I know it, there is some sort of... must have been some time when it suddenly dawned on us. But I can't remember it. Well, in fact, when you are faced with a situation of having to turn something out, do you then try running over phrases on a guitar that have been going through your mind for some time, seeing what you can Yeah, we, that's another trick, to, <laughs> to try some, an old song, yes. you know, one that never quite made it, and take a bit out of it that was, wasn't bad. In other words, don't try and make Yeah, and try and make that into a song. Yes. Do you t- store away in your minds odd phrases that you hear from time to time that will make a good title? I think I try to, but I'd always forget them if they're stored away in my mind. They might come back without me knowing. You there's bits from other records, I think, I'll pinch that. And I'll never remember it. Well, you jumped in very quickly there, John. Does this mean that you're the words expert in particular? No. You know, it's, <laughs> I find it just as hard words or music. You both have to be in the right mood when you, you, you're working together, collaborating on a song. Do you, yeah. Does one have to wait for the other to, uh, to Very start? seldom, you know. If we both don't feel like it, we just have another ciggy. And if, if, if one does, does, does the other say, well, well wait till next week? The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a, bit, it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to, you know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing of it. Because we don't write in between... Uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. Because we don't write in between uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. I'd have thought it was quite impossible, really, to say, right, we've got to write 12 songs for an LP, let's settle down to it. It is some days, and this last time was very impossible, because the, I don't know, okay. the holiday spirit... Mm. You know, the sun's shining and... Well, it was at the time. So we tried uh, writing them in the garden then. Mm. And then you forget about it, start looking at flowers and trees and things like that, really. I guess he gives you some ideas when you're recording your songs. Do you give him any ideas on his recordings of your songs? Sometimes we go along to the sessions, you know. B gives us more ideas than we give him, I think. Because he's at all of our sessions and we're not at all of his. In fact, I think I've been to one. Did you get any particular interest out of the... uh, the bigger lineup that was available to him. Oh yes, yeah. It's uh, 
The only, the only trouble, the main trouble with having big lineups and things is you use session men, and session men are all great technically, but you've got to write exactly what you want out on paper for session men. And so it's easier with us because you can sort of say to George, no, not that, uh, a bit more like so and so, uh, and you know, and he'd do it, you know what you meant. But if you said to a session man, no, uh, you know, do it a bit like sort of, uh, you know, well, then he'd, he'd need it written down. So that's the only big trouble, really, with uh, doing it with big bands. You've got to you've got to know exactly how to write, and it's very difficult to, to write bending notes and things on instruments, you know, you can't... Uh, and so that's why sometimes the versions by other people can sound a bit square occasionally. Yesterday took the uh, listening public a bit of a surprise, I think. It's a bit of a shock to them. You have since then recorded some more with an unusual instrumentation in the backing. Mm. Um, was this inspired by the success of yesterday, or did you do it because you liked it? Well, the, the, see, the... Uh, the idea for yesterday of doing it like that was because um, we, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not v all that good anyway, musically. We, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not v all that good anyway, musically. So there was something like yesterday. The best we could have done with it would have been uh, This Boy or If I Fell. You know, those are sort of, I think, two mm. of the best that we've done like that with a group and still managed to put the song over in the way it should have been. But with Yesterday, uh, it would have just meant either another If I Fell or another this, but you know, another Beatles combo doing a slow one, you know. So um, we did it like that and nobody seemed to mind, least of all us, I think, you know, because we didn't have to play, we didn't have to show ourselves up again <laughs> on record. <laughs> The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a bit its a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to, you know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing of it. Because we don't write in between, uh, in between LPs normally. We're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not v all that good anyway, musically. As soon as Harrison took the sitar into the studio, he became important, because up to that point, George Martin, the producer of the Beatles, was terrible to him. He used to say, you will play these notes. George Martin, the producer of the Beatles, was terrible to him. He used to say, you will play these notes. Here they are on the piano, you will play this. He was the underdog of the Beatles. He was the one who had the most miserable time. Harrison was very much younger, in particular, than, than Lennon, and Lennon used to patronise him and call him that kid. That stuck for an awful long time. That's another root of this sort of resentment and this feeling of discomfort and, and, and rancour that he had as a Beatle. Let's break down what Paul and John told us in the August 5th, 1966 BBC interview. Let's first focus on the yellow highlighted box on the slide. In the interview, we were told they did not normally write songs between albums, and if they did, they penned maybe one or two songs. And because Paul said maybe one or two, we cannot rule out that there were times when no songs were written in between albums. And because they did not write between albums, Paul said they wrote in great big batches whenever an album or film was scheduled. Paul and John also told us they were not motivated to write while they were on holiday which I'm assuming was the time they had off between the conclusion of their tours and the beginning of recording an album. For example, right after their U.S. tour in 1965, they had a six-week break before entering the studio on October 11th to begin recording Rubber Soul. During that break, even the mainstream narrative tells us they didn't write any songs. The Rubber Soul backstory tells us they came into the sessions with no backlog of music. That being the case... That means they did not write songs while they were touring, and they did not write songs during their six-week break or holiday. In fact, for Rubber Soul, we are told they wrote all 16 songs, 14 for the album and two for a single, in the studio over a 30-day period of time. So Paul and John's explanation of when, where, and how they wrote the music maps nicely with the mainstream Rubber Soul narrative, meaning all the songwriting and rehearsing was allegedly done in the studio and not while they were touring 
and not when they were on holiday or vacation. Now let's move to the light blue box. Paul and John explain, in their own way, that songwriting was not spontaneous and could be challenging, and therefore the process took time. Paul then explains the only time they had to force themselves to write, which was an interesting choice of words, is when an album or film was coming up, and then adding, it took them weeks to get one song written for Revolver. If on one hand we're being told songwriting is a process that takes time, then how does forcing yourself to write top-shelf songs in batches under the pressure of time constraints in the studio make any sense? Even the BBC interviewer questioned the feasibility of writing 12 songs on demand or in batches, as Paul described it. I will argue it is not believable they could write 10 to 14 songs on demand while under a tight recording schedule, especially after telling us songwriting is an iterative process that takes time. The two explanations are a contradiction. It also begs the question, does this mean every song they started was completed? There were no false starts or throwaways? This is highly unlikely. Then Paul makes an extremely revealing admission when he told the interviewer, we're limited as a group. We're the first to say we're not all that good musically. We have to put Paul's admission into this context. He is making this statement after the Beatles finished up their seventh studio album. If they were limited as a group and not all that good musically after recording Revolver, then how much more limited were they musically going back to Please Please Me and all their other albums before Revolver? Paul then acknowledges the bigger lineup available to George Martin. That bigger lineup is referring to the session players George Martin worked with as a producer. For those that follow my work, you know that I concluded it is studio players who played on the Beatles' recorded tracks, especially during the 1962 through 1966 period. How can we reasonably believe that the Beatles wrote so many hit songs and were on the recorded tracks when we are being told straight up by Paul McCartney that the band was limited and not all that good musically. And then Paul drops another bombshell by telling us he didn't play on Yesterday, a comment that flat out contradicts the official narrative, which tells us it was Paul playing guitar on the song. By stating they did not normally write between albums, with the exception of maybe one or two songs, Paul essentially narrowed the window of songwriting opportunity down to the studio. Writing eight, 10, 12, or 14 great songs in batches in a short period of time, whether it was the 30 days for Rubber Soul or the two and a half months for Revolver, is simply not believable, especially when Paul and John discuss the challenges to get just one song written. If we listen to the interview objectively and with discernment, it offers tremendous insight into what was really going on behind the scenes. The interview also confirmed my suspicions from my Chapter 3 analysis which led to a deeper dive to figure out what was going on with the Beatles' songwriting. The funny thing is, if I had known about the BBC interview back when I was working on the April 2020 presentation, my Chapter 3 may not have been needed, since Paul and John answered the very questions I was asking. Up to this point, the assumption is the Beatles, in particular John and Paul, wrote their songs and played on the recorded tracks. But when we factor in the constant and exhaustive touring, popping pills, smoking weed, and being high on film sets, and writing most, if not all of the songs in batches when heading to the studio, seriously challenges the official narrative of John and Paul being two prolific and genius songwriters. Top that off with Paul admitting they were limited as a group and not all that good musically, and the House of Cards is collapsing. And we have yet to discuss the pre-1964 period to understand what was going on behind the scenes to move the band into the frenzy of Beatlemania. All of this is leading us back to the Rubber Soul model, where I determined all of the songs were pre-written by outside songwriters and recorded by studio musicians, with the Beatles being on the hook to sing the vocals. Here's a version of a slide from my April 2020 presentation. Column 3 of the slide depicts the number of days between the ending of one album and the beginning of the next. Column 4 shows the number of days the Beatles performed a live gig during that period of time. I concluded the schedule was too hectic for significant levels of songwriting to take place. Yet, a common argument by Beatle fans is the Beatles had ample time to write songs in between album releases in spite of their busy performance schedule. However, as I just covered, Paul puts an end to the debate when he stated 
the Beatles did not normally write in between albums, and the only time they needed to, quote, force themselves to write songs is when an album or film came up. Therefore, per Paul McCartney, the Beatles, in particular John and Paul, wrote very few songs, if any, between albums. Here's another slide from Chapter 3 of my 2020 presentation, where I categorize time at a high level. The chart on the left is the original slide I presented for the two albums released in 1965, Help and Rubber Soul. With touring decreasing from 1964 levels, the Chapter 3 chart on the left suggested the Beatles had six months to write music since they weren't in the studio, on a film, or touring. Yet, with Paul admitting they did not normally write in between albums, that admission shifts most, if not all, of the songwriting workload to the time frames of the recording sessions for Help and Rubber Soul. The chart on the right reflects this shift based on Paul's comment. Whereas I originally suggested the Beatles had six months out of the year to potentially write music, Paul narrowed that window of opportunity down to four months. For Help and Rubber Soul, this means they wrote, rehearsed, and recorded 30 original songs plus two covers within a four-month period of time. And remember, between the recording dates of the Help album, the Beatles were also filming their Help movie in a haze of marijuana and, according to John, were pretty much useless after lunch. In my opinion, once we weigh all the variables, the premise that the Beatles wrote all their own music becomes less and less likely. Before we proceed to recapping Rubber Soul, let's take a closer look at the pre-1964 period where the Beatles went from obscurity to a worldwide phenomenon in only three and a half years. The first gigs outside the college was at the Jacaranda, which was a, a tiny uh, little coffee bar where they played in the cellar. I think they got about uh, five shilling each. The Jacaranda was owned by Alan Williams, a small-time entrepreneur operating on Liverpool's Bohemian Fringe. His latest enterprise was supplying rock and roll groups to a club in Hamburg. When no other act was available, Williams proposed the Beatles. The group that was playing there was one of the, the big groups in Liverpool, which was uh, Derry and the Seniors, featuring Howie Casey, the lead. And he sent me a letter over saying, look, Alan, we've got a good thing going over here for all the Liverpool groups. But if you send that bum group, the Beatles, over to Hamburg, you're going to louse it all up. For God's sake, don't send them. John and Paul had written at least 100 songs together since they met in 1956. But they hadn't recorded any, original or otherwise. Okay. Not until they went to Hamburg again in 1960 did they make their first record. And then only as a backup group for their friend Tony Sheridan. The result? an awkward rock and roll arrangement of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. So Brian then had this tape which he hawked around and I think it was somebody in the HMV shop on Oxford Street mm. knew George Martin and told Brian to go and play the tape to George Martin and then he gave us the audition at um, Abbey Road. What I said to Brian was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. And he was so disappointed. I felt really sorry for him, actually, because he an earnest young man. And you must, you must have liked him, then? I did, I did like him. And I, I said, but I tell you what, I gave him a lifeline. I said, if you want to bring them down from Liverpool, I'll give them an hour in the studio, OK? George had done little of uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in a studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I couldn't make out the sound, you know, it was something I hadn't heard before. So, besame, besame mucho. They had this wonderful charisma. They, they made you feel good to be with them. Mm. And uh, I thought their music was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, besame, besame mucho. Even though they had uh, nothing really behind them, they were still fairly irreverent, even in those days, which I, which I loved. You know, I, I, I like a little bit of rebel in people, and I like their sense of humour. Uh, after all, that was my main stock in trade too. And I guess they quite liked what I've been doing with 
Peter Sellers and the Goons, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I looked at these four guys and thought, well, none of them shines as being above all the others. And I had to make up my mind, in my silly mind, who the lead singer was going to be. Suddenly I realized I would take them as they were, as a group. The hell with a lead singer. They would be singing together. So we were struggling with the sound a bit. And I said to the boys, after we'd done a few takes of rather nondescript songs, I said, come into the control room and have a listen and see what we've been doing. And uh, if there's anything you don't like, tell us. Well, I was looking for something original because I didn't want to do one of the oldies that they've been doing as part of their act. And Love Me Do was the best song that they, I could find from them at that time. I was very conscious that it wasn't the, the big hit I was looking for. I spent a few hours with them in Abbey Road and fell in love with them because they had great charisma. They certainly had no, uh, no it, didn't, it, was, it wasn't at all obvious that they could be songwriters at this stage, but their songs were pretty awful. And even then, Love Me Do was the best thing yeah. we had. Let's take a look at the Beatles' early period starting in Hamburg. This is a slide I covered in a presentation I did on the 1960 through 63 period where I asked if the Beatles' rise was organic or engineered. The link to that show is in the description box below. Let me break down the chart step by step. The Beatles went from their first Hamburg gig back in August of 1960 to landing in America on February 7, 1964 in approximately three and a half years. Keep in mind the Alan Williams clip we just heard where he tells us the Beatles were called a bum group when he was trying to get them booked in Germany. The complete Beatles documentary tells us John and Paul, either separately or together, wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. As we review the timeline, ask yourself this question. Where are the 100 songs? Especially when we factor in George Martin's comments regarding the band's lack of musical and songwriting skills. Back when the Beatles started in Hamburg, John was 20 years old, Paul was 19, and George was 17. They were a young and inexperienced band with average, if not marginal, musical skills, along with showing no indication of songwriting ability. Now, moving to bullet four, the Beatles began an ongoing and constant schedule of live performances within the UK as well as Hamburg. Along with these live performances, the Beatles were also doing their BBC gigs from March of 1962 through May of 1965. The Hamburg stints ran from August of 1960 through December of 1962. How did you spend your time outside the club when you were basically through working? What'd you do? Well, by the time we'd finished working, in those days we used to work eight hours a night. We'd start at six and finish at two in the morning during right. the week. What'd you do before? In other words, your basic time for enjoying yourself was mm -hmm. before and maybe a little uh, after, but mo most of the time before. What did you do before, before you went into the club? Well, by the time we'd woken up, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, great. Now that you had, you know, all sorts of time. You had mm -hmm. two hours to do what? Yeah, well... You walk around and you see the rest of Hamburg? Yeah, well, we, you know, the first time we were there, we were like, as well as being musicians, we How were How did tourists. people take, take you when you walked around? Did you walk around in black leather jackets? Uh, after about a month, we walked around in black leather people jackets. People stare at you all the time? Oh, yeah, all the time. To add to Pete's comments, the band's early Hamburg living conditions were less than desirable. Let's revisit a passage I covered earlier in this presentation from the book Lenin Prophecy by Joseph Nisgoda. In August of 1960, the Beatles began playing a 48-night run at Hamburg's Indra Club, their first professional bookings as the Beatles. The club was located near the Reeperbahn, an urban hell, the city's red light district, an area rife with strip clubs, sex shops, harlots, crooks, drugs, and numerous drinking establishments. The band was lodging in conditions that biographer Barry Miles describes as appalling. The Beatles slept in the dressing rooms of a run-down former cinema and bathed in its restrooms, and the situation didn't get any classier. The Beatles took full advantage of the lifestyle, drinking and spending their money as quickly as they were paid. They had at their call many of the local girls and prostitutes, which came with its problems. The boys were treated often for sexually transmitted diseases. By December... The Beatles returned home broke, dejected, and dispirited, their future as a band uncertain. The book goes on to say that Paul did nothing but laze around the house 
with his father constantly pushing him to get a job while John spent vacant hours home alone. And that's the passage from Lenin Prophecy. Then on January 1st, 1962, only 16 months from their start in Hamburg, the Beatles find themselves at Decca to record 15 songs. Of the 15 songs, 12 were covers and 3 were nondescript originals. The original songs were Like Dream Is Do, Hello Little Girl, and Love of the Loved. One might ask this question. If John and Paul wrote 100 songs between them going into 1962, why did cover songs dominate the Decca demo? It should also be noted that none of the original songs from the Decca session made it onto any of the band's official UK album releases during the band's period together. Decca was not impressed and declined to sign them. Then in February 1962, Brian Epstein met with George Martin of EMI where he played the tapes. Martin was also not impressed and declined to sign the band as well. But then something happened. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, we are told George Martin's decision was reversed and he was instructed to take the band on, which resulted in a signed contract with EMI in June of 1962, with some sources stating the contract was signed a month prior in May of 62. The Beatles went from their rough and tumble beginnings in Hamburg to a signed contract with a major label in only one year and ten months. According to memoirs, once the Beatles were signed, George Martin initially assigned his assistant, Ron Richards, to work with the band. When the results of the working sessions did not go well, George Martin was instructed to work with the band directly. In other words, there was to be no delegating. Then the music publication, Mercy Beat, published an article in the August-September 1962 edition announcing Ringo Starr replacing Pete Best as the drummer. However, the article also stated the Beatles will be flying to London to make recordings at EMI Studios. They will be recording numbers that have been specifically written for the group, which they have received from their recording manager, George Martin. So if John and Paul wrote 100 original songs between them, starting in 1956, then why is George Martin having songs written for them? Perhaps it's because the 100 songs of the official narrative never existed. And if the songs never existed, or at the very least, were not very good, then where are all the songs coming from going forward? Remember, we heard George Martin himself say they showed no signs of songwriting acumen, that they had nothing behind them, and he thought their music was rubbish. On March 22, 1963, the Beatles' debut album Please Please Me is released, containing eight original compositions and six covers. So the lads went from an obscure bar and club band in August of 1960 to the release of their debut album on a major label in two years and seven months. This is after George Martin stated the best song they had when he met them was Love Me Do. But now, seven more original songs appear between June of 1962 and February 11th of 1963, all of which are arguably far better compositions than Love Me Do. Couple this with the official story telling us the Beatles recorded 10 of the 14 songs for Please Please Me in one long session on February 11th, and something doesn't seem quite right. And keep in mind, all of this manifestation is happening as the Beatles are steadily performing live with their repertoire of cover songs on an almost daily basis. Even their BBC performances, especially early on, were predominantly cover tunes. So we have to ask the question, what is really going on here? Then in October of 1963, after the release and success of Please Please Me, Memoirs explains that both John and Paul entered into a Faustian bargain. Is it true? I don't know. I'll let you decide. But then, only eight months after Please Please Me, the Beatles' second UK album, With the Beatles, containing eight more original songs, was released on November 22, 1963, the same day U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And then, only 77 days after the release of With the Beatles, the lads land in America on February 7th, 1964. So from the crude beginnings of Hamburg to the United States and the start of Beatlemania in three and a half years, does this progression seem organic or manufactured? Now let's take a moment and look at the elapsed time between some of the key events of the 1960 through 63 timeline. Again, keep in mind in August of 1960, when the Beatles arrive in Hamburg, John was 20, Paul 18, and George 17. 
They were a young, inexperienced, and rough-around-the-edges bar and club band. Their skills as musicians was marginal at best with no indication or proof of songwriting acumen. With that in mind, here is the chronology. The Beatles went from Hamburg in August of 1960 to their Decca audition on January 1st, 1962 in one year and four months. From Hamburg to their EMI contract in June of 62 in one year, 10 months. From Hamburg to the release of Please Please Me in March of 1963 in two years, seven months. From Hamburg to the release of With the Beatles in November of 1963, their second UK album, in three years, three months. From their EMI contract in June of 62 to the release of Please Please Me in March of 1963 in nine months. From the release of their debut album Please Please Me in March of 1963 to the release of their second UK album With the Beatles in November of the same year, eight months. From Hamburg in August of 1960 to the United States in February of 1964 in three and a half years. I will argue This type of progress did not happen organically, and there is far more to the Beatles story than what we have been told. A lot more. Before we continue on, here is a July 1971 New Musical Express article where Norman Smith, who was the Beatles' engineer up through Rubber Soul, discusses his early dealings with the Beatles. The article is a good example of the truth hidden in plain sight. It presents both the fictional and non-fictional storyline. In the article... Norman tells us he was not at all impressed by the Beatles and they were awful, wording that is almost identical to what we heard George Martin say about his impressions of the band. Smith also says his musical doubts about the band were backed up with Love Me Do, saying we had some hard times working on that one, as well as making the comment that the band failed in the studio. Then we get the interlaced fictional account of the story when Norman says the Beatles talked their way into the contract and they had so much personality and so much magic about them. Again, words similar to George Martin saying the lads had charisma. The article goes on to say, We did their first album, Please Please Me, in one take, and we did the whole thing in a day. That's how we did it then. On one hand, we're being told the Beatles were not impressive and awful. Their musical ability was in doubt, they had a difficult time getting Love Me Do recorded, and the band failed in the studio. Then, in the same breath, We're told they talked their way into a contract and recorded their first album in one take in a single day playing live. How does an unimpressive, awful band who failed in a studio and struggled to record Love Me Do then turn around and nail their first album in one take in a single day playing live? An awful and musically lacking band does not talk their way into a contract regardless of how much charisma, personality, and magic they might have and then pull a rabbit out of the hat by miraculously transforming into musical virtuosos who nail an entire album in one take in a single day, playing live. And keep in mind what Paul McCartney told us in the August 5, 1966 interview after the release of Revolver, the band's seventh album. He said, We're limited as a group, and we're the first to say we're not all that good musically. Ask yourself, How does what Paul McCartney told us back in August of 1966 reconcile with what Norman Smith is saying in this article from 1971? I'm not going to say it. I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to ask you about it. So. No. Yeah, you got it. You did this. Come on now and say it, man. Come on, you know, man. Talking, I, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do the question. Talking no. of fixing records, no, no. there's a rumor no, no, no. <laughs> that nobody really ever confirmed <laughs> that you may have fixed some of the Ringo Starr tracks for the Beatles? <laughs> okay, there was an answer. <laughs> the part that hurts, the real, real part that hurts is that the people do not understand fixing records was a way of life. In the 60s and the 70s. It was a way of life fixing up records because 98% of the groups, self-contained groups, are not on their own albums. They are not on their own albums. And what I did, and what I was doing, was going in, I was one of the few drummers 
who could actually go in, join the group, and make the records. Because the record companies were paying a lot of money to make these records happen. My thing was, I got along with everybody, and I never went out and started hollering and complaining, no, that ain't so-and-so, so-and-so doing this, that, and the other. And I just did a job. The Beatles music was just another job for me. Another job. Because half of the songs that I played, I played on 21 tracks of the Beatles. Half of them had no drums. Because they kicked him out in the beginning. And the whole point is that whether you realize it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, it becomes irrelevant at this point. But you're going to find out that he's not on anything. The man made his money, and his money and everything else was made by live. The man spent a million dollars promoting the Beatles. Brian Epstein spent money to promote the Beatles. And that was unheard of in the 60s, to spend that kind of money to do something. Ringo took somebody else's place in that band because that's who they wanted and that's who they could control. And that's all it was. It was all about control. He looked the part that they wanted. He was the one that he chose. And that's what they did. But the making of those records and the fixing of those records 98% of them were first recorded early in England and brought to the United States to be done and fixed. That's why Mercury Records and Capitol Records, they both have Beatles albums. I did mine in the Capitol Studio in New York City. I had no idea who the hell the Beatles were or anything else. I was doing a job. And that, for me, is the hardest thing because I've had my life threatened too many times. And at this point in my life, I don't care anymore. <laughs> and it really doesn't bother me whether I talk about it or do anything else about it because I don't have to go back there or to deal with it in life anymore. And I'm very proud of that for my sake what he did, he made his money, he did what he needed to do. He doesn't have to answer to anybody else for what he's done. And it's a shame to, you know, for things to happen this way, but it did happen. And it has happened with too many other people. There are four drummers on the Beatles music. Ringo is not one of them. Album is also Ringo Starr, and you said he is like myself with the guitar. What, what did you mean by that? Well, we've grown for so many years, grown together, grown up together, and as a drummer, I know Ringo is a great drummer, but he is bad. He doesn't practice, but it doesn't seem to matter. He just picks up the drumsticks, and he and for my songs, he's very good because he listened to the song once, and he knows exactly what to play. He was the kind of drummer who never likes drum solos. So he just plays, keeps good time, and, and he instinctively knows when there's a little piece that needs a fill. And it's the same with me. You know, I, people call me a guitar player. And I, in a way, I'm a guitar player, but I never practice. There's years and years in my life where I never pick the guitar up except just to make a record. But I know I could be quite good but I don't practice enough. That first occasion with him was all really a Brian's fault. Because nobody told me that, you know, when, when, when they walked in, this fella came in, this little chap, and I said, You're our drummer? I said, No, he's not, that's your drummer. We're paying good money for that fella. And, you know, we had the best drummer you get in the. In Andy session. White? Yeah. Who will never live it down. I didn't realise until quite late on how much I hurt him by that. And I didn't I know. mean to. Well, he's a sensitive soul, Ringo. Yeah, yeah. He is a sensitive kind of guy, you know, and, and I don't think...
we realised how much that hurt him. Yeah. But um, he got over it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, he, he was not precise, and so you, I think you were wor used to working with session drummers who were yeah. on the ball. No, no, you know, he, he was not precise, and so you, I think you were wor used to working with session drummers who were... Yeah, on the ball. And what happened in the Beatles, you know, when we played live, if Ringo sped up a tiny bit, we all just do -do 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 went yeah. with him. So you, nobody really noticed it. Give me a short version, if you would, Paul, about the breakup. How did, how did it happen? Um, we'd been together like 10 years. And, and during the making of the White Album, things started to get a little bit edgy. Um, in fact, during the making of Sgt. Pepper, George hadn't showed for most of the album. In fact, during the making of Sgt. Pepper, George hadn't showed for most of the album. Which was unusual, as we normally showed for our recording mm -hmm. sessions. <laughs> George hasn't been too interested in making that album. I think he was building a swimming pool. And it was just all a little bit like that. And of course, I was sort of thinking, you know, I thought, well, I won't say anything, but it's a bit dodgy. We went on to make the White Album, and... Um, Things really did start to kind of disintegrate a little bit. They were getting more and more interested in unusual sounds, and um, uh, yes, I mean, they were trying out new instruments and always coming to me saying, what, what ideas have you got for this, you know? Um, yesterday had been a breakthrough. We'd used, first time we'd ever used other instrumentalists on the, on the records. The only person who had ever played with them before was me. And now we had a group of other musicians. So we weren't averse to using other people. And now we had a group of other musicians. So we weren't averse to using other people. Or other sounds. Um, and Rubber Soul was an indication of the way things were going to go. It's one of my favorite albums. I think it's a great album. The guitar solo in the shell is my composition. I actually uh, wrote down the notes as I play this. George, you can do, do these notes with me on the guitar. We'll play you That kind of thing. The six clips I just played are important because they help us to understand what was really going on behind the scenes. In the first video, legendary studio drummer Bernard Purdy states in a 2004 interview that he drummed on 21 Beatles songs. Based on other interviews, Bernard is referring to the work he did during the early Beatle period between 1962 and 1966. Aside from the 21 Beatles songs, Bernard was also hired to fix some of the songs the Beatles did with Tony Sheridan. When Bernard talks about fixing records, he is talking about drumming on a song that either had a click track with no drumming, or replacing a pre-existing drum track, which was likely a scratch track. Think of a scratch track as a placeholder that is meant to be re-recorded. Bernard then tells us fixing records was a way of life in the 1960s and 70s, and 98% of the bands did not play on their own records. This is what I refer to as the Wrecking Crew model. He tells us, fixing Beatle records was just another job, which tells me the Beatles were no different than the 98% of the other bands who did not play on their own recordings. Bernard then says, they kicked Ringo out from the very beginning, and Ringo made his money playing live, not in the studio. Then he states, Brian Epstein spent $1 million promoting the Beatles, which was unheard of back in the day. To put this amount of money into perspective, $1 million back in 1964 is the equivalent of $9.7 million today. Bernard then tells us Ringo was brought in because he could be controlled and because he fit the part, while adding 98% of the early recordings were sent from England to the U.S. to be fixed. It's interesting to note that aside from Bernard, the wrecking crew was also U.S. based. He then tells us he had his life threatened but has gotten to the point where he doesn't care anymore. Then he finishes up by saying, there are four drummers on the Beatles' music, and Ringo is not one of them. Many times I get asked who I think the four drummers are during the 1962 through 1966 period. We know Andy White was one of the drummers because the official narrative tells us he was hired by George Martin to play on two songs from 1962, Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. Although I personally believe it's possible Andy drummed on more than those two songs, and maybe it's Andy we hear on the entire Please Please Me album. We know Bernard Purdy drummed on 21 songs, and a relative of the great session drummer Ronnie Verrill told me Ronnie was another drummer on Beatle recordings. The fourth drummer, 
Perhaps it was Hal Blaine from the Wrecking Crew, but that's a guess. In the second clip, George Harrison explains that neither he or Ringo practiced, and George went years without playing the guitar and would pick it up when he needed to record. Not practicing or rehearsing does not hone skills and does not improve musicianship. Very few producers, especially big-name producers like George Martin, are going to tolerate anyone coming into the studio who is not on top of their game and who does not meet studio playing standards. To believe otherwise is wishful thinking. In the third clip, Billy, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, is chatting with George Martin, where Martin is discussing the hiring of Andy White to drum on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, which was the A and B side of the single released in 1962. Billy then explained that George Martin was used to working with session players who were on the ball and then saying Ringo lacked timekeeping precision, which would be problematic in the studio because the drummer's ability to keep time is very important. The fourth clip, which is an interview from 1990, Billy explains to Bernie Goldberg that George Harrison was essentially a no-show for the Sgt. Pepper sessions. If George was a no-show, then who was playing guitar on the recorded tracks he was credited with playing on? The point of this clip is to point out that the story meant for public consumption can be very different than what actually took place. In the fifth clip, George Martin, who is great at masterfully speaking, which is a Masonic technique to speak in an encoded way while also revealing the truth, explains with the obligatory official narrative as a backdrop that he was the only person outside the Beatles who was recording with them as an instrumentalist until yesterday was recorded. And as a side note, if we go back to the August 5, 1966 BBC interview, we now know Paul McCartney, who was credited with playing acoustic guitar in the song, was, like the rest of his band, not on the recording. George Martin then explains that with Yesterday, they now had a group of other musicians, so they were not averse to using other people. And then adds, Rubber Soul was an indication of the way things were going to go. I will argue, George Martin, by masterfully speaking, was acknowledging the use of studio musicians on the Beatles' recordings. But instead of admitting studio players were always in the mix, he uses Yesterday as the starting point. Now, some might say he was referring to the direction of the music, but I would argue that 1. The Rubber Soul sound began with the release of Help, and 2. Based on what I covered in my April 2020 presentation, along with this follow-up, how could we realistically believe that a band that admits they were limited and who were not all that good musically is the band playing on the recorded tracks? In my opinion, the evidence that studio players were on the Beatle recordings from the very beginning is overwhelming. And with the sixth clip, we have George Martin stating the guitar lead in Michelle, which was a track on Rubber Soul, was his composition, and he dictated the notes to George Harrison. This is exactly how Philip Norman explained the interaction between George Martin and George Harrison. Just like the Norman Smith article I covered earlier, we have the truth interlaced with the storytelling of the official narrative. I think it's probable the entire composition of Michelle was written by George Martin, recorded by studio players, with Paul McCartney singing the lead vocal. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, we are told Paul McCartney did not write Michelle. It was written for him. With these six clips as table setting, let's now review the Rubber Soul sessions to understand why I consider it to be the elephant in the room, which left a trail of evidence that proved to me the Beatles did not write any of the 16 songs produced from the sessions, nor were they the musicians on the recorded tracks. Scott Fryman is the creator of the Beatles Deconstructing series. Scott is a composer, musician, and musicologist. He is an internationally recognized expert and lecturer on the music of the Beatles. He is the co-founder and CEO of QWire Incorporated and has a Bachelor's of Computer Science and Music from Yale University and a Master's of Music Composition from New York University. From the Deconstructing Rubber Soul presentation, we are told in the fall of 1965, the Beatles were exhausted, having just come off their U.S. tour, which was cut short in order to make an album for the Christmas season. As I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the Beatles were on the hook to produce two albums a year starting in 1963 through 1965. The DVD tells us, along with the 14 songs for the album, 
the Beatles also needed to record two additional songs for a single, as well as a flexi-disc for their fan club. Mr. Fryman's narrative tells us the Beatles had not been writing material, and they came into the studio on October 11, 1965, empty, meaning they entered the sessions with no backlog of songs. To have Rubber Soul in stores by Christmas, the Beatles had to write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 songs within 30 days and wrap up by November 11th. The album was released in stores on December 3rd, and both sides of the single, as well as the album, hit number one on the charts. The Wikipedia version of the backstory is essentially the same, with the exception of some interesting wordsmithing and additional information. Wikipedia states, After the tour's conclusion, the Beatles took a six-week break before reconvening in mid-October to record the Rubber Soul album. The article then goes on to say, Most of the songs on Rubber Soul were composed soon after the Beatles returned to London following their August 1965 North American tour. Whereas Deconstructing Rubber Soul is much more specific, the Beatles entered the studio with no meaningful backlog of music and the songs were written in the studio and not during the break. By Wikipedia stating the songs were composed soon after they returned from their tour does not tell us anything tangible. What does soon after mean? How soon after? The Wikipedia phrasing is ambiguous, and I believe intentionally so, because the official timeline is problematic once it is scrutinized. By stating soon after the Beatles returned home from the tour implies some level of writing may have taken place over the six-week break and thus allowing for a little more runway or wiggle room to write songs. This is a technique that is used often in the Beatles' narrative, where the mainstream platforms lead the audience to use their imagination to fill in gaps by making assumptions and then from those assumptions forming conclusions that are not based on a reliable level of specificity or evidence. In other words, they lead the audience to speculate. The Wikipedia passage is clever, because on one hand it states they were on a six-week break, and then implies the Beatles may have started writing songs during the break. If they were writing songs, which also needed to be rehearsed, then I would argue they weren't on a break because they would have been working. I also found this technique with sites like the Beatles Bible, where short, vague, and nonspecific blurbs are given regarding the origins of the songs on Rubber Soul. For example, Norwegian Wood was an idea John Lennon had earlier in 1965. What goes on goes back to the Quarrymen days. Parts of Michelle can be traced back to 1959, and so on. I also noticed the Beatles Bible has incorporated passages from Billy's book, The Lyrics, 1956 to Present, to help fill out the narrative around the songs of the Beatles. Of course, Billy is not Paul, and his versions of events are awash with fictionalized accounts of the what, when, and where of Beatle history. In a 1987 television show on George Harrison, Beatles author Philip Norman explains why George is the key to obtaining the truth about the Beatles' history. Let's take a listen. The Beatles is not a normal story. It's a supernatural story. And the pressure was supernatural. And it required supernatural luck and forbearance to recover from it. And he has recovered from it. He's the one that we're going to have to ask about the Beatles. There's no one else to ask now because McCartney won't tell you. Ringo can't tell you. John isn't here. When you say Paul won't tell you, what do you mean? He rewrites history all the time. And Ringo can't tell you because... He doesn't know. He doesn't know? No, he just, um, he drank the drink, he smoked the joints, he had the girls, and he drummed the drums. That was Ringo. Given Scott Fryman's expertise and knowledge regarding the Beatles' narrative, I'm going to go with his account of the official story, which tells us the Beatles came into the Rubber Soul sessions empty, with essentially no backlog of music. And Scott's narrative syncs up nicely with what Paul McCartney told us back in the August 5, 1966 BBC interview, where Paul told us the Beatles did not normally write songs between albums, and the only time they had to force themselves to write is when an album or film came up, and then they wrote in great big batches. Paul also told us in that interview that he and John were not very motivated to write songs when on holiday. You both have to be in the right mood when you, you, you're working together, collaborating on a song. Yeah. Does one have to wait for the other to 
Uh, very start. seldom, you know. If we both don't feel like it, we just have another ciggy. And if, if, if one does, does, does the other say, well, well wait till next week? The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a, bit, it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to, you know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing of it, because we don't write in between, uh, in between LPs normally maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. Because we don't write in between, uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. I'd have thought it was quite impossible, really, to say, right, we've got to write 12 songs for an LP, let's settle down to it. It is some days, and this last time was very impossible, because the, I don't know, okay. holiday spirit. Mm. You know, the sun's shining and... Well, it was at the time. In so fact, we tried uh, writing them in the garden then, mm. and then you forget about it, start looking at flowers and trees and things like that, really. Other information from Wikipedia states, with the band forced to work to a tight schedule, the sessions were held over 13 days and totaled 113 hours, with a further 17 hours spread over six days allowed for mixing. The sessions were routinely booked to finish at 3 a.m. each day with John Lennon and Paul McCartney struggling to complete enough songs for the project. The October 27th session was cancelled because of lack of new material. Oddly enough, with all of this worry about not having enough time to write, rehearse, and record new songs, the lads stepped out of the studio to receive their MBEs on October 26th and were also out of the studio for another two days filming a television show on November 1st and 2nd. It would seem to me that with such a sense of urgency, Events outside of writing, rehearsing, and recording would have been scheduled to sometime after November 11th when they were done with recording. Now let's take a look at the Beatles' 1965 calendar to get an understanding of what the year looked like leading into the making of Rubber Soul. Here's a graphical depiction of the Beatles' schedule for that year. In January, the Beatles were finishing up their Christmas shows in London. Then by mid-February, the help recording sessions began which ran through June 18th, and tucked within the recording timeline of the album, the Beatles also filmed the help movie. The filming of the movie took place between February 23rd through April 14th, and per John, the lads did so in a haze of marijuana. Right after the completion of the recording of the help album, the Beatles were off on their European tour, which consisted of 15 shows from June 20th through July 3rd. After a break from the European tour, they were back on the road again, this time touring the U.S. from August 15th through August 31st. After completing the U.S. tour, they had a 39-day break before starting the Rubber Soul sessions, which took place from October 11th through November 11th. And then it was back on the road again, finishing up the year with a U.K. tour. The August 1965 tour was their second concert tour of the United States, which included one date in Canada. At the peak of American Beatlemania, they played a mixture of outdoor stadiums and indoor arenas, with historic concerts at Shea Stadium in New York and the Hollywood Bowl. Typical of the era, the tour was a package presentation with several artists on the bill. The Beatles played for 30 minutes at each show, following sets by supporting acts such as Brenda Holloway and the King Curtis Band, Cannibal and the Headhunters, and Sounds Incorporated. As I just mentioned, the start date for the U.S. tour was August 15th and ended on August 31st. So there were 16 shows in 16 days as the Beatles flew across the U.S. The official narrative makes no mention of any songwriting taking place during the tour or between September 1st and October 10th when they were on holiday right before entering the studio to record Rubber Soul on October 11th of 1965. And as Paul McCartney stated in the BBC interview from 1966, the Beatles, in particular Paul and John, did not normally write songs between albums, which would include when they were touring or on holiday. Instead, they wrote their songs, per Paul, in great big batches whenever an album or film came up. So whether intentional or not, the official narrative leading into Rubber Soul is consistent with what Paul told us. As I have shown over and over again, the Beatles' schedule was hectic. 
When I covered these slides in my April 2020 presentation, I asked the question, when did they have time to write all of these incredible songs? The girls still screamed, but the excitement was gone. Touring had become intolerable. And it became a terrible prison for them because um, all they could do was to go to the concert and then go back to their hotel room and be locked in. They had no life at all, they were just the four of them, and no one knows what kind of a life it was except those four themselves. Not even Brian or I knew really all the problems they had to go through when they were on tour. It's a bit hard when you get up first thing in the morning and you travel all day. You get to a hotel and there's thousands of people outside. You're out in your bedroom. So how they came through, I just don't know. So was that hard, though, to play? Because you feel like, are they listening? Can they hear me? Well, it was part of the life we had. And uh, we couldn't hear us. So, you know, it seemed to be you came to see the Beatles and then Paul counted it in, then you just screamed till we bowed and left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was great, the atmosphere was great, but what made us round about uh, 66 uh, question this was that we were becoming really mediocre players, musicians, because we had to just, I just had to just keep time. You know, I go, um, bah, um, bah. if I went to do a fill, um, um, bah, was like in silence. You know, so I'd be watching Paul's foot or John's ass. You know, that's how it ended up. And we became, we made a conscious decision. We were, were becoming loose musicians. There are two fundamental problems with the Rubber Soul timeline. The first is the highly improbable scenario of the Beatles writing, rehearsing, arranging, and recording 16 new original songs in 30 days. The second issue has to do with cycle time to manufacture or produce the record, which includes the creation of the record labels, album art, sleeve design, printing, packaging, and distribution. Logistically, it was not possible to have the album in retail on December 3rd based on when recording concluded and the final lacquer was cut, which was on November 17th. There simply wasn't enough time. From November 17th to December 3rd, when the album was in stores, spanned a mere 16 days or approximately two and a half weeks, and that includes counting weekends. In my April 2020 presentation, I explained that back in the day, the process to expedite an album's release took six to eight weeks, if not longer, with six weeks being an aggressive schedule. So how did George Martin and EMI reduce the cycle time down to a little over two weeks? I concluded the only way it could have happened was for some of the processes to have already been underway before the Beatles arrived in the studio. I will go into more detail in a moment, but let's first take a look at the 30 days the lads spent in the studio. From deconstructing Rubber Soul and other mainstream sources, we are told the Beatles had partial or draft versions of Michelle and We Can Work It Out coming into the Rubber Soul sessions. Partial or draft songs are not completed songs, and still require time to finalize and rehearse before recording. We are also told the basic rhythm tracks for Wait were recorded during the help sessions, which means for Rubber Soul, only the vocals and any overdubs would need to be attended to. And the narrative also states the Beatles did an unrecorded demo of What Goes On two years prior in 1963. Now to be clear, I'm not saying I buy the backstory on any of these songs. I'm simply presenting the mainstream version of what the Beatles may have had in their back pocket coming into the Rubber Soul sessions, which, even if the official narrative is accurate, wasn't much. Based on information sourced from official narratives such as the Beatles' Bible and Wikipedia, we are told the Beatles recorded eight original compositions in 18 days between October 11th and October 29th. They were able to accomplish this feat by recording all eight songs in only 28 takes for an average of three and a half takes per song. For anyone familiar with the recording process, this alone should raise a red flag. But it gets even stranger. In November, the Beatles finished recording the remaining eight songs within 13 days or in five days less than it took to record the first eight songs in October. And they accomplished this task 
in a total of only 14 takes for all eight songs. So in November, they recorded the same number of songs as in October, but in five fewer days and in half the number of takes. Also, the narrative explains that recording for eight of the 16 songs began and concluded on the same day. Those songs are denoted with an asterisk on the chart, and they were Run For Your Life, Drive My Car, Day Tripper, Michelle, What Goes On, Think For Yourself, The Word, You Won't See Me, and Girl. And last but not least, we are told four of the 16 songs were completed on November 11th, the very last day of recording. One of those songs was Wait, which was a holdover from the help sessions. If we look at the graphic on the right, we can see on October 12th, one day after arriving in the studio, the Beatles recorded Run For Your Life in five takes. Then two days in, Drive My Car was in the bag after four takes. Five days in, Day Tripper is wrapped up in three takes. And seven days in and in one take, the Beatles complete If I Needed Someone. The rate and pace, when considering they needed to write and rehearse the songs, defies not only probability, but possibility. If, as we are told, they had no meaningful backlog of songs coming into the sessions, and that is the narrative, then the writing would have been at a feverish pace, with no false starts or throwaways. It means every song they started was completed with little to no adjustment. Then the songs would have to be rehearsed with all of their instrumental parts and arrangement spontaneously falling into place with barely a hiccup. With regard to takes, all 16 songs for Rubber Soul took a total of 42 to record the basic rhythm tracks. To understand how questionable that number is, let's look at the number of takes for some of the songs on the White Album. While My Guitar Gently Weeps required 44 takes. Sexy Sadie, 117. I Will, 68. Happiness is a Warm Gun, 70. Long, 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 67, and so on. The math alone for Rubber Soul does not add up. I think it's possible the number of takes represents the number of attempts it took to get the final vocals recorded after the Beatles learned and rehearsed the song. Assuming the Beatles wrote all their own music, compare the Rubber Soul narrative against what John and Paul told us in the BBC interview about how songwriting is a process and how it took weeks to get just one song written for Revolver with Paul also stating they were limited as a group and not all that good musically. The Rubber Soul narrative is completely unrealistic. The only scenario that fits this type of schedule is if the songs were already written and recorded by the time the Beatles arrived in the studio on October 11th. And once there, the Beatles' sole responsibility was to record the vocal tracks and to get it done within 30 days. In an upcoming chart, I will explain how I determined the process worked not only for Rubber Soul, but for all of their albums between 1963 and 1966. But first, let's take a listen to five excerpts from some interviews with John, Ringo, and George Martin. In the first two Lennon clips, John Lennon refers to Bob Dylan, McCartney, and the Beatles as a myth. When asked about his own guitar playing, John reluctantly admits he's embarrassed by his playing, and when asked about George as a guitarist, John says George was a pretty good guitarist. Not an excellent or great guitarist, just a pretty good one. Then John refers to the Beatles as performers, as well as reminiscing back to the band's bar and club days and how the music died upon making it big, and then stating they had become technically good recording artists. He never says technically good musicians or songwriters, but recording artists, which to me is code for singers. At the end of the first interview with John, You will hear him in another interview he did back in 1975 with the BBC, where he discusses the Beatles' primitive music ability within the context of working with George Martin. After listening, ask yourself, based on John's own assessment of his skills and that of his bandmates, how could they have possibly pulled off Rubber Soul in 30 days? In the third and fourth clip, from two different interviews, Ringo refers to the quote, writers, and does not associate the writers with John Lennon or Paul McCartney. In the fifth clip, from the documentary produced by George Martin, composer Howard Goodall questions George Martin on whether the Beatles had the musical background to compose songs such as Blackbird, Yesterday, and For No One, which Mr. Goodall states crop up everywhere, 
with their Anglican stroke Lutheran harmony structures. As Howard is asking the question, George Martin flashes the Masonic tell no secrets hand gesture where he brings his index finger to his lips. For those familiar with the symbolism, George Martin is communicating he won't reveal the secrets that the Beatles, with the exception of perhaps Billy and the song Blackbird, did not write these songs. Martin is telling us that Biological Paul did not write Yesterday or For No One. In my April 2020 presentation, I present evidence that both Yesterday and Hey Jude are reworkings of old Neapolitan songs. Based upon my research, I concluded the Beatles' original compositions, especially during the early period between 1962 and 1966, but also applicable to a lesser degree to the 1967 through 1970 era, were written by Tavistock and EMI ghostwriters, with the songs credited to Lennon and McCartney as part of the Beatles' psychological operation. Crediting songs to artists who did not actually write the music is a common practice within the music industry. Let's take a listen to the clips. I expect more, you know. Maybe I expect too much from people, you know. But I expect more. You know? But uh, I haven't been a Dylan follower since he stopped rocking, you know. I like Rolling Stone and a few things he did then, you know. I like a few things he did in the early days, but the rest of it's just like, you know, McCartney or something, you know. It's no different, you know. It's a myth. Let's refresh that. It's always, always the Beatles were talked about, and the Beatles talked about themselves as being four parts of the same person. Yeah, well, to make that, yeah. What's happened to those four parts? Well, they, 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 did, they remembered that they were four individuals. You see, we believe the Beatles myth too. You know. I don't know whether the others still believe it, but, you know. We were four guys that uh, I met Paul and said, do you want to join my band, you know? And, and then George joined, and then Ringo joined. We were just a band who made it very, very big, that's all. You know? And sometimes our best work was never recorded, you know. Because we were we were performers, in spite of what Mick says about us, in Liverpool, Hamburg, and around the dance halls, you know. And what we generated was fantastic. Well, we played straight rock, and there was nobody to touch us in Britain, you know. But as soon as we made it, we made it. The the, the, the edges were knocked off. You now Brian put us in suits and all that, and we made it very very big. But we sold out, you know. And the music was dead before we even went on the theatre tour of Britain. We were, we were, we were feeling shit already, because we had to reduce it. an hour or two hours playing, which we were glad in one way to twenty minutes, and go on and repeat the same twenty minutes every night. The Beatles' music died then, as as musicians. That's why we never improved, you know. As musicians, we killed ourselves then to make it, and that was the end of it. And uh, George and I are more inclined to say that, you know. We always missed the club days because that's when we were playing music and then later on we became technically efficient recording artists which was another thing because we were competent people you know and we can whatever media you put us in we can produce something worthwhile you know. how do you how do you rate yourself as a guitar uh well it depends what kind of guitarist you know i'm okay you know. i can't i'm not technically very good but i can make it fucking howl you know and move I was rhythm guitarist, you know, and it's, it's an important job. I can make a, a band drive, you know. How do you rate George? Uh, he's pretty good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer myself, you know, I have to be honest, you know. I mean, I'm really very embarrassed about my guitar playing in one way because it's, it's very poor, you know, I can never move. No, but I can make you. a guitar speak, yeah. you know. I, I think there's a guy called Richie Valland, no, Richie Haven. Does he play very strange guitar, you know? Uh, he's a black guy that was on Isle of Wight concert, sang Strawberry Fields or something. Oh, Richard Yeah, he plays like one chord all the time. Now, he plays pretty funky guitar, but he doesn't seem to be able to play in the real time. I'm like that, you know. But Yoko's made me get cocky about my guitar, because yes, he keeps saying... Why? He, he yeah, if I play you... Okay. See, one part of me says, yes, of course I can play, because I can, I can, make, I can make a rock move, you know. But the other part of me says, well, I wish I could just do it like B.B. King, you know, if you put me with B, I feel silly, you know, but I can really make a, a, I can, I'm an artist, and if you give me a tuba, I'll bring you something out of it.
George had done little of uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in a studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background, so he could translate for us and suggest a lot of things, which he did, you know, and he'd come up with amazing technical things like slowing down the piano and playing it slow and putting it on, and, and things like that, you know, where we'd be saying, well, can we, we're on it, go, ooh, and, and e, e, and he'd say, well, Look, chaps, I thought of this this afternoon. Last night I was thinking, I was talking to uh, whoever he was talking, and I came up with this, you know, and we said, oh, great, great, <laughs> or put it on here, you know. And like in Walrus, when we made it, we had, on the mix of Walrus, we have a live radio coming through, mm. you know. So whatever came through on the radio was like, now, if I just, I don't know where it came from, if I said, I want the radio on it, George would make it so as I could mix, and there the radio would be coming through the machines, you know. But he also come up with things like, uh, well, have you heard an oboe? No, oh, which one's that? Is this one? Yeah, that would be nice. Mm. You know, things like that. So it was really, we grew together, you know? Mm. And so it's like saying, it's, it's hard to say who did what, you know? Yeah. I mean, he taught us a lot, and I'm sure we taught him a lot by our, our sort of n primitive musical ability, which is all I have still, you know? I still have to have something to translate what I'm trying to say all the time. And so it was a mutual benefit, mm. society, whatever they call it. And our whole attitude was changing. Um, we'd grown off a little. Uh, I think grass was really influential in a lot of our changes. Um, especially with, with the writers, you know, so because they were writing different stuff. Especially with, with the writers. You know, so because they were writing different stuff. Uh, we were playing differently. We were all, you know, expanding in, in all areas of our life, you know, opening up to a lot of different uh, attitudes. What brought you to the point where you could say, as you said in that same interview, I'm the best rock and roll drummer in oh, the world? That's I a very am. confident statement. I am. Okay. So what gave you the confidence then, Ringo? Well, I had that uh, a long time ago. It's just that they started asking me about it now. Um, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, because of the songwriters, uh, which is a very powerful force in the Beatles, and John and Paul mainly as the singers. Because of the songwriters, uh, which is a very powerful force in the Beatles, and John and Paul mainly as the singers. And I was just playing the drums and nodding my head so I'd get noticed. Um, and doing one song, um, you know, there was never anything really said about the drummer. You know, and if you look at Charlie Watts and the Stones, there's never anything really said. It's like, oh, it's Charlie Watts. And you know, he's an, an amazing drummer. But, you know, the drummers tended to not get the, the writing. And, uh, Which is curious when, because usually the drummer is the driving force of the band. It is the driving know? force, but when you have songwriters of that caliber and singers, I mean, I'd much prefer to talk about the songs and the writers. But when you have songwriters of that caliber and singers, I mean, I'd much prefer to talk about the songs and the writers. Uh, more than, you know, some sort of parody that I could do. Now, I've got a specific musical question for you okay. that intrigues me, which is that in several songs, uh, particularly the ones by Paul, there is a kind of Lutheran stroke Anglican harmony going on. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I think you know what I yeah. mean. Blackbird. Uh, um, they're all over the place. Um, and yesterday, um, these are hymn-like harmonies with hymn-like bass lines and they crop up all over the place um, for no one. Uh, they're using inversions where the bass isn't the root chord. There are all sorts of things going on. And my question is, where's this coming from? Because it, 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 maybe it's to do with your influence and your background, and you suggested, look, you could do these bass lines that weren't no. what you'd expect to do. It was them. It really was them. Uh, I can't really claim. <laughs> I wish I could claim part of the songs. I'd be much richer. The interview excerpts I just played are five very important clips. We had John Lennon in an honest and frank conversation, telling us the truth about what was really going on behind the scenes, 
John essentially told us he liked being a rock and roll cover band and the rawness of the early days before the fame and fortune killed the music. And then saying he and his bandmates sold out as they became performers and technically good recording artists. John never says he was a great musician or a great songwriter. In fact, he admitted that aside from straight up rock and roll chords, he was embarrassed by his guitar playing. And when the interviewer asked John his opinion on George as a guitarist, John says, George is pretty good. Not extraordinary, not great, not excellent, just pretty good. Which is what we might expect from someone who never practiced, which is what George told us about himself and Ringo in the clip I played earlier in this presentation. I'm not picking on John or his assessment of George's playing abilities. In fact, I respect his honesty. The reason why it's important is because John's opinion of his skills is diametrically opposed to what we are led to believe from the official narrative. Think about what John just told us, and then think about the guitar playing on songs like In My Life, Norwegian Wood, Nowhere Man, and Your Bird Can Sing, and so on. That's not the work of guitarists with primitive music skills or who do not practice. Lennon then states, Bob Dylan, McCartney, and the Beatles are a myth. If one is able to shed the dogmatic conditioning of the official story and objectively listen to what John is saying, it's clear he's telling us the official story of the Beatles is, as he called it, a myth. Ringo referring to the songwriters and not associating the writers as John and Paul is extremely important. In fact, he said John and Paul were mainly the singers. The amazing thing is, Ringo says this in two separate interviews, with the second one from 1975 with Tom Snyder, when he brazenly declared himself the best rock drummer in the world. I think there were probably a few of his contemporaries who would have taken issue with such a declaration, especially based on Bernard Purdy's comment that he was not the drummer on any of the Beatles' early recordings. The last clip with George Martin and Howard Goodall, who was an accomplished composer in his own right, is pure gold. By understanding the occulted symbolism, we received a direct answer from George Martin on whether the Beatles were writing their own music, and the answer is, they were not. Let's now take a look at the second problem with the Rubber Soul timeline, and why I concluded it is additional evidence that the Beatles did not write the songs for the album or play on the recorded tracks. More important... She is an expert at hearing the slightest imperfection on a record surface. And should she find any, a new lacquer master from the original tape is immediately ordered from New York. After audio testing, the mold goes back to the plating tanks. It produces the most important new metal part, the stamper. This completes the cycle. Lacquer to master, master to mold, mold to stamper. The metal buildup to the stamper is exactly the same, except for one thing. The stamper is nearly all pure hard nickel. Its ridges press the playing grooves into the finished record. Now it's prepared for stamping. Ground perfectly smooth on the back. Optically center punched for the record press. Trimmed to exact diameter. And coined. Given a formed edge to grasp the stamping die securely. The record press is a complicated piece of equipment weighing two tons. It molds records by compression. Our stamper is mounted on the top die. Below it, another stamper simultaneously presses the other side of the record. The record compound, the finest pure vinyl obtainable, is fed into the press in granular form. It is forced by hydraulic pressure into a soft plastic in just the right amount for one record. The labels are pressed right into the record. Now we're ready to roll. It has taken many steps and many man hours to get here. But a new record is stamped every few seconds. The record press automatically heats the vinyl plastic for stamping, then automatically cools it, so the record can be played immediately. <laughs> 
And here's the first long play copy of Romeo and Juliet. A collector's item? No. The first pressing is always carefully inspected for everything from the correct serial number to perfect centering. Then, still another playback test. And finally, the pressing of the Romeo and Juliet gets going in earnest. And for those who prefer the 45 extended play version, and for the millions of teenagers anxiously awaiting the latest top hit, an ingenious machine turns them out automatically. It places its own labels, feeds itself the vinyl compound, removes its own records, and stacks them already trimmed. And for the fast-growing legions of tape enthusiasts, equally ingenious machines turn out duplicate copies at four times the playback speed to save time, and backwards to save rewinding. And no matter what your taste or preference in music, in the packaging area you discover unlimited variety, the finest in sound and performance. The reason I included the brief clip on how records are manufactured is because many people don't think in terms of the manufacturing process. The process to press a record begins once the final lacquer has been approved and finalized. Once finalized, the lacquer results in a stamper which is used to press the vinyl. In the video, it's stated that by the time the album is pressed with the center labels, it has taken many steps and many hours to get to that point. The first pressing is a test pressing which then requires additional playback to ensure everything is good to go. In fact, all along the process, there are checks to ensure quality control. Aside from the work stream having to do with the actual pressing of the record, there is also the process of designing and creating the artwork for both the front and back covers of the album, as well as printing the record labels that will be adhered to the vinyl once the records are pressed. Here is a version of a slide from my April 2020 presentation which depicts at a high level the two work streams. The green boxes represent the process to press the records, with the blue boxes denoting the process to design and create the artwork and labels. After recording ends, but before the lacquer is created, the songs are mixed, mastered, and sequenced. Once the initial lacquer is created, a test pressing is made. This is done to ensure there are no issues with the pressing. Once the test pressing is approved, the stampers are created to press the records. Prior to pressing the records, the record labels need to be created. The labels contain the names of the songs on the album, and in many cases, the run times as well. The labels will be adhered to the center of the vinyl records during the pressing process. The designing and creation of the album art for the record sleeves is also underway. The pressed records will be inserted into the sleeves. The record is now ready for distribution. Since both the record labels and album sleeves contain the titles of the songs, they cannot be created until all the songs are known and sequenced. Let's keep this in mind as we move forward. The printing process for album sleeves is ink-based and called four-color printing, which is the most widely used method for printing full-color images. The four colors are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. The printing process required one week to dry before handling the album art. Once dry, the album art, which is also referred to as the album slick, is adhered to the cardboard record sleeves forming the front and back covers of the album. Once the record sleeves are finalized, the records are inserted into the jackets. The records are then boxed and ready to be distributed to record and retail outlets. It should be noted that back in the day, retail was a decentralized model, meaning the records needed to make their way to the many brick and mortar stores throughout the UK. Therefore, Transportation and delivery of the records is also a variable within the timeline. An expedited cycle time for the entire process to release the album, if EMI pulled out all the stops to get Rubber Soul out, is six to eight weeks, with six weeks representing a very aggressive schedule. The typical cycle time to release an album could exceed two months or more. The cycle time information I am presenting was sourced from an industry insider who has been in the music business for decades 
and is well-versed in the process. For the April 2020 analysis, I applied six weeks to calculate the release process in order to give George Martin and EMI the benefit of the doubt. Here is a summary of the mainstream rubber sole timeline, starting with the conclusion of recording on November 11th. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, the Beatles finished up recording late in the evening into the early morning hours of November 12th by completing four songs, two of which they started and finished that same day. Those two songs were You Won't See Me and Girl. They also wrapped up I'm Looking Through You, which they began recording on November 6th, and then finished the vocals for Wait, whose basic rhythm tracks were laid down during the help sessions, or so we're told. On November 15th, George Martin completes the final mix. On November 16th, he does the sequencing, which determines the order the songs will appear on the album. The very next day, on November 17th, the final lacquer is cut, which is the precursor to creating the stampers, which then begins the process of pressing the vinyl. We can see the timeline is moving very quickly, indicating there is a rush to get the pressing process underway in order to get the initial batch of records out the door and into stores by December 3rd. But then there is a glitch. The pressings made from the November 17th lacquer had an issue. EMI mastering engineer Harry Moss cut the album too loud and shortly into the production run, EMI ceased production and had to recut the lacquer two days later on November 19th. I wondered if the mastering error was the result of rushing Rubber Soul through the process leading to bypassing certain control points in order to expedite the album's release. It's just a thought. In any case, the December 3rd deadline was met with at least an initial delivery to stores for the start of the Christmas season, with the record continuing to be pressed after December 3rd to fulfill anticipated demand. Now let's take a look at the elapsed time between key dates, with the most important date being the cutting of the first final lacquer on November 17th, because that's the starting point from when the pressing of the record begins. At this time, the record labels must be in-house along with the album sleeves in order to package the record. From November 11th, which was the end of recording, to December 3rd, which was when Rubber Soul was in stores, spanned a mere 22 days. From the final mix on November 15th to December 3rd, 18 days. From the sequencing on November 16th to release, 17 days. From when the original lacquer was cut on November 17th to December 3rd, 16 days or just over two weeks. And then, only 14 days from when the lacquer was recut on November 19th. So from the cutting of the original lacquer on November 17th to the record being in stores on December 3rd was a very expeditious 16 calendar days or approximately two weeks. The time calculations include weekends because, in my opinion, the only way EMI was able to hustle the initial shipments out the door within this time frame was to have the pressing plant turning out records, not only during normal working hours, but also into the evening and weekends in order to meet the December 3rd date, which was a Friday, with additional deliveries of the album continuing after the 3rd. It would be a challenge to assume EMI dedicated 100% of its resources and capacity to Rubber Soul because of all the other albums they were pressing from other artists on the EMI label, whose albums also needed to be in stores for the Christmas buying season. To focus exclusively on the Beatles would have impacted EMI's revenue expectations from Christmas sales, especially if the initial deliveries of Rubber Soul were limited until quantities increased as records were continuing to be pressed. So it's very possible a lot of after-hours and weekend shifts were in place to crank out the record in order to get the first batches delivered. Although EMI's ability to get the initial deliveries out the door was an impressive feat, we do have a problem. In order to press the records, once the lacquer was cut on November 17th, EMI had to have the record labels and album sleeves on site with the names of the songs and the track sequence printed on both the labels and sleeves. Without the names of the songs and the sequencing of the tracks, the labels and album sleeves cannot be printed. In other words, without the song titles and sequence, EMI would have had blank labels and an album cover with no song titles. Since the official narrative tells us the Beatles were essentially writing from scratch, the question of when were the song titles known and finalized is a good question. For example, we're told Think For Yourself had a working title which was Won't Be There With You. When did the working title of the song change to Think For Yourself? When were the song titles nailed down for any of the songs? The point is, 
If the Beatles were heads down, banging out songs in batches, then the situation was fluid. With the songs being written on a day-to-day basis, then the song titles were also emerging day-to-day. So not knowing the names of the songs that were yet to be written or having songs with working titles is a precarious situation because it's holding up the process to create the labels and album covers which require the names of the songs. But there is a more significant problem at hand. Until the final recording of the songs is completed, the actual run times of the songs are not known. Without the run times, then the sequencing cannot be done because the run times not only play an important part in determining what order the songs will be heard on the album, but are also required in order to determine which tracks fit properly on side A and side B when factoring in track lead-ins and dead wax in order to ensure the record is cut correctly. The official story states George Martin did the final sequencing on November 16th, which was one day before the original lacquer was cut on November 17th, and only 17 days before Rubber Soul was to be in stores on December 3rd. Sequencing determines the order in which the tracks will be heard on the album. Without the songs being sequenced, then the labels and album cover cannot be finalized and printed since both the labels and the cover list the songs in sequenced order. How are the labels and album sleeves ready by November 17th when the sequencing was completed just one day prior on November 16th? There was no way to turn around the printing process in that time. Even if we move the sequencing back to November 12th, the day after recording, the timing is not plausible. And both the labels and album cover needed to be proved before they could be printed and mass-produced. The only way this could have worked is if the names of the songs and runtimes, as well as the sequencing, were known and completed well in advance of November 16th meaning the labels and album sleeves were already printed with the sequence song titles and on standby for when the pressing and packaging process commenced. In other words, the names of the songs and sequencing were already known and in the bag well before the lacquer was finalized. So how was it done? Well, I concluded all of the songs were pre-written by outside songwriters and recorded by studio players prior to the Beatles entering the studio on October 11th. Because the songs were written and recorded in advance, the names of the songs and the runtimes were known. And with the runtimes known, the sequencing can be done, and with the sequencing completed, the process to manufacture the labels and album covers could begin. This all took place well in advance of the Beatles arriving in the studio to complete Rubber Soul. I determined the mainstream narrative is a fictionalized story. The Beatles did not write a batch of songs leading into or during the studio time frame, and they were not the musicians playing on the recorded instrumental tracks. They were there for 30 days to learn the vocals and then record them. And the story of George Martin's sequencing on November 16th makes no sense once we understand the process. What really took place on November 16th, if I had to take an educated guess, is George Martin handed the tapes over to Harry Moss for mastering in order to create the lacquer so they could start pressing the record. Here's a timeline chart to illustrate when the manufacturing process for Rubber Soul may have started based on various cycle times. The process, assuming the photo shoot took place prior to the sessions, would include the cover picture, layout design, color printing, the folding and gluing of the record sleeves, creating the record label, printing the labels, creating the master lacquer, pressing the vinyl, packaging, and shipping. And remember, pressing the vinyl can only start after the record labels are finalized and printed. In general terms, a cycle time of two months or more would be considered a standard time frame for the manufacturing process of an album once recording has concluded. In my April 2020 presentation, I applied a six-week schedule which represented an aggressive but doable timetable if EMI dedicated enough resources and capacity to getting the record out. The top half of the slide denotes the dates I have been discussing, starting with the Beatles arriving in the studio on October 11th through December 3rd when Rubber Soul was released. The bottom half of the chart in the yellow highlighted box illustrates, theoretically, when the manufacturing process would have begun in order to ensure Rubber Soul was in stores by December 3rd. In all cases, 
the number of days is in terms of calendar days in order to capture the possibility that EMI was expediting the process. If work days were used for the calculation, then the start dates would have been even earlier than shown on the slide. The first bar is an eight-week cycle time, which shows the process beginning on October 8th, which was three days before the Beatles arrived in the studio. The second bar is the six-week calculation and has the start date beginning on October 22nd. The last bar is a four-week view, which would represent EMI almost entirely focused on the release of Rubber Soul at the expense of other artists, which is an unlikely scenario for reasons I explained earlier in the presentation. The four-week scenario pegs the start date at November 5th. In all of the scenarios, whether it be four, six, or eight weeks, the labels and album covers needed to be completed and finalized no later than November 17th when the final lacquer was created, since that is when the pressing process begins. And remember, the labels are applied at the same time the records are being pressed, so November 17th was a hard stop date, and it's very likely the labels and covers were in the queue and ready well in advance of the 17th to ensure ample lead time. Anything beyond November 17th was not going to work. Now let's calculate the four, six, and eight week cycle time, starting with the cutting of the lacquer on November 17th, which is when the manufacturing process would begin to see when Rubber Soul would have been in stores in a real world scenario. If the process took eight weeks, then Rubber Soul would have been in stores on or around January 12th of 1966. At six weeks, which is the expedited cycle time for my analysis, the album would have been in retail on December 29th. And when we calculate four weeks, Rubber Soul would have been delivered on December 15th. Regardless of which scenario was applied, the album would have easily missed the December 3rd date. This is why the process, as explained in the previous chart, had to have started well before the cutting of the lacquer on November 17th. Now let's take a step-by-step -step look at how I concluded Rubber Soul and all of the Beatles' first seven albums were created. You both have to be in the right mood when you, you, you're working together, collaborating on a song. Yeah. Does one have to wait for the other to, uh, to Very start? seldom, you know. If we both don't feel like it, we just have another ciggy. And if, if, if one does, does, does the other say, well, well wait till next week? The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a bit it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to, you know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing of it, because we don't write in between... Uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. Because we don't write in between, uh, in between LPs, normally. Maybe just write sort of one or two, and then we have a great big batch. I'd have thought it was quite impossible, really, to say, right, we've got to write 12 songs for an LP, let's settle down to it. It is some days, and this last time was very impossible, because the, I don't know, okay. holiday spirit. Mm. You know, the sun shining and... Well, it was at the time. In so fact, we tried uh, writing them in the garden then. Mm -hmm. And then you forget about it, start looking at flowers and trees and things like that, really. We, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. We, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. Here is how I determined Rubber Soul was created and we can extend this model to all of the Beatles albums between 1963 and 1966. During the early period, the Beatles songs were written by professional songwriters on the Tavistock and EMI staff. The number of writers was probably no more than five or six, with George Martin in the role as managing director, overseeing the overall Beatles initiative, as well as a likely composer. Another major player was Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School, who I believe was a major stakeholder in the Beatles' initiative and working closely with George Martin. It's also possible Adorno was one of the writers contributing to the portfolio of Beatle music. For those interested in learning more about Theodore Adorno and his role, please watch my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? The link is in the description box below. I color-coded the slide to make it easier to follow the process. Blue represents the timeline from January 1st through October 10th, the day before the Beatles entered the studio. Yellow denotes October 11th through November 11th when the Beatles were recording the vocal and harmony tracks for the album. 
The green box is the final mix. This is when George Martin merged the vocals and instrumental tracks to complete the songs. Red represents the cutting of the lacquer, the pressing of the records, and preparing the album for distribution and delivery. Starting with step one and the blue boxes, this is the time period leading up to October 11th when the Beatles were performing their UK shows, doing their European and US tours, filming Help, and recording the Help album. While the Beatles were attending to their schedule, behind the scenes, professional songwriters wrote the songs for Rubber Soul with George Martin doing the arranging. Because the songs are already written, the song titles are known. The instrumental tracks were then recorded by session musicians and mixed down in preparation for the vocals. With the instrumental tracks recorded and mixed, the run times for the songs are known, allowing for the sequencing to be done. Also during this time frame, the album art, sleeves, and labels are created and sent out for printing in order to ensure both are in-house for when the pressing and packaging process begins. In Step 5, which is the yellow box, from October 11th through November 11th, the Beatles are in the studio to learn and rehearse the vocal melodies for each song and then record the vocal tracks. In Step 6, which is the green highlighted box, on November 15th, with all the vocals now recorded, George Martin does the final mix to merge the pre-recorded instrumental tracks with the vocals. In steps 7 through 9, George Martin hands the final tape off to the EMI production team to start the process of cutting the lacquer which takes place on November 17th, which then leads to the creation of the stampers. The records are then pressed, packaged, and expedited in order to make the December 3rd deadline. Logically, Rubber Soul had to be created in stages, otherwise the December 3rd date could not have been met. So I concluded, this was the model used for all of the Beatle albums up through and including Revolver. The process also extended into the 1967 through 1970 period, although during this phase of the Beatles' timeline, John and George were writing more of their own compositions and playing on more of the recorded tracks, but with outside songwriters and studio players still in the mix. It should be noted that this approach to creating and recording music, which I refer to as the Wrecking Crew model, is not unique. It's a model that has been the foundation of the pop music industry from the beginning and still in play today. For those that are unfamiliar with the Wrecking Crew, they were a loose collective of Los Angeles-based session musicians whose services were employed for a great number of studio recordings in the 1960s and 1970s, including hundreds of top 40 hits. What we have from 1962 through 1966 is four young men in their 20s who could grind it out and be the veneer for the music that was not written by them, but as the 1962 Mersey Beat article stated, written for them by uncredited professional songwriters and composers who were working behind the scenes on behalf of Tavistock and EMI to use the Beatles as a social engineering tool. The Beatles were not groomed to be songwriters because Tavistock already had their writers. The Beatles were schooled, starting with their Hamburg gigs, to be the performers on the world stage who would play the music and recite the scripts that were given to them by social scientists operating behind the scenes. The relentless performing in the early 1960s, up through their meeting with George Martin in 1962 and beyond, was to develop their performance skills so they were ready to hit the road running once Tavistock decided to throw the switch to bring Beatlemania and the ensuing tidal wave of social change into the mass consciousness. During the early years, the Beatles were a cover band playing bars and clubs, and ironically, in the end, that's exactly what they continued to be through 1966, since they were covering the music that was written for them. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, not one song from Revolver was played during their live performances after the album was released. Why would that be? Why would a band not play any new tracks from their newly released album? Also, why would their set of 11 songs include two covers when by this time they had 77 original songs under their belt? A likely reason for not playing any of the tracks from Revolver is because they didn't know how to play the songs. The songs they performed live were songs they needed to learn to play in order to take them out on the road as part of the Beatle illusion. Sometimes I get asked about audio recordings of the Beatles where a narrative tells us it's the Beatles in the studio either rehearsing for or participating in a recording session. I have argued we need to consider the likelihood that what we are hearing in these audio clips, especially between 1962 and 1966, 
is actually the band rehearsing the songs they were taught to take out on the road, as well as the outtakes from studio sessions where the Beatles are working with the pre-recorded instrumental tracks. It's my opinion that many of these audio and bootleg tracks were intentionally released to feed the imagination of the worshipping fan base and strengthen the illusion of the official narrative. I have found that people have an uncanny knack for believing what they are told to believe without any meaningful level of inspection. So I will suggest that audio alone without the interlock of film footage is not evidence because it can be misconstrued and taken out of context, taking on a life of its own by morphing to accommodate an individual's belief system based on how immersed they are in the conditioning. Up until the Get Back sessions in January of 1969, which I will discuss in a moment, I have yet to come across any authenticated film footage of the Beatles actually writing songs or in the recording studio laying down the recorded tracks for an album or single. Considering the Beatles had cameras following them around everywhere documenting their quote history, it's interesting there is zero footage of them engaging in their craft as prolific and genius songwriters. John Lennon and Paul McCartney are regarded as two of the greatest pop composers of all time, yet we have no documented footage from any of their first seven albums to corroborate such lofty claims. To quote Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and it's the official narrative that has the responsibility to provide the extraordinary evidence, since it's the official narrative making the extraordinary claims. It's not me. All I did, after believing the mainstream story for most of my life, was to finally look under the hood to see if all the parts to the engine were there. And when I found missing parts and stories that did not make sense, I started asking questions while putting forth my own evidence to back up my inquiries and positions. I believe it's because of not having authenticated film footage to document the official narrative storyline regarding their creative genius that the Get Back sessions were created. It was a last-ditch effort, spearheaded by Billy, to prove they could perform superhuman feats whenever they needed to. But the Get Back sessions only reinforced my conclusions that the Beatles, even with Billy leading the band, fell woefully short of their objectives. We have to remember, the goal for the sessions was to write, rehearse, and record 14 new songs in the studio in less than three weeks, then play two live shows, which would segue into a TV special. It's another fantastical tale that never materialized. The two and a half weeks became a month, with the band ending up playing just five songs on the rooftop of Apple Studios to no audience and with no TV special. What many fans don't realize is the songs from the Get Back sessions and ultimately on the Let It Be album were still being recorded, edited, and mixed after the January sessions and into early 1970. The Let It Be album was the result of John Lennon handing the tapes over to Phil Spector, who took some heat for his work on the album. But Lennon, in a Rolling Stone interview, defended him by saying he, meaning Spectre, was given the shittiest load of badly recorded shit with a lousy feeling toward it, ever, and he made something out of it. He did a great job. End quote. So a band, which at this point in 1969 had seven years of studio experience behind them, not only completely failed to write and record 14 new songs in less than three weeks and perform live to a real audience, but ended up releasing what many fans and critics consider, based on Beatles standards, an overall lackluster album. And in the end, let it be proved what the Beatles were not capable of. I should also note that during the Get Back sessions, the Beatles were a captive audience. There were no MBEs to be received, fan club activities, or TV specials to attend, like they did during the Rubber Soul sessions. Their sole job during the Get Back sessions was to write, rehearse, and record 14 songs in less than three weeks, and it didn't happen. I also found evidence that some of the Beatles' live performances were augmented by either backstage musicians or pre-recorded backing tracks. One great example is their 1966 performance of Day Tripper at Budokan, where the song begins with the iconic riff, and both John and George miss their cue and are caught momentarily not playing their guitars as the song kicked off. Another trick used when they were assisted by offstage musicians or a backing track when playing live and being filmed, was to turn their backs to the camera to conceal their playing of a riff. In watching concert footage, I found this technique was applied mostly with George Harrison and occasionally with John Lennon. When a particular lead guitar part or riff would come up, George would turn his back with the camera immediately panning away from George and to Ringo or another Beatle. 
An example of this technique can again be seen during the Budokan performance whenever the main riff for Paperback Writer was about to be played. When the moment comes to watch George play the riff, he turns away from the camera. I will leave a link to the video I did on Day Tripper and Paperback Writer in the description box below. To be fair, backstage musicians and backing tracks have been used for a long time in the music industry and still used today. But of course, the Beatles' official narrative, like most of the stories emanating out of the music and entertainment industry, create the illusion of unbridled raw talent to lure the unknowing masses into idolizing their entertainment gods. Another media illusion are the videos with fans screaming at extreme levels, yet the music on the audio track is unaffected by the noise. Research by Global Sound Group estimated the Beatles' 1965 Shea Stadium concert reached 131.35 decibels. To put that into context, that's 28 decibels louder than the sound of a jumbo jet just 100 feet overhead. And earlier in the presentation, we heard Ringo tell us it was so loud that not only could he not hear his bandmates instruments on stage, but he couldn't even hear his own drumming, especially when playing the toms. When the Beatles played baseball stadiums, their vocals were piped in through the PA system, which is about as low quality as you can get, and never mind the echo effect. People who attended their concerts have told me they couldn't hear a thing with all the screaming. I have watched footage of the Beatles playing live, where John's microphone was swaying back and forth because it was not fastened to the mic stand properly. Yet, even with the microphone swaying back and forth, that is, moving away from his mouth, the volume of his vocals remained unchanged. Back during this era, the recording technology was primarily two-track machines. Isolating the music and vocals with fans screaming at over 100 decibels would make it incredibly challenging, if not impossible, to capture the sound quality we hear on many of the performances we see on videos, DVDs, and other media. So with audience noise levels, vocals going through stadium PA systems, swaying microphones, and technology limitations, we have to ask this question. How is it the sound quality on so much of the concert footage is very good? The answer is post-production enhancements. For the footage that counts, I suspect the Beatles machine went to great lengths to enhance the audio with overdubs and then syncing the concert footage with the improved audio tracks in order to clean up the performances for public consumption and overall presentation. As John Lennon sang in Nobody Loves You from his Walls and Bridges album, it's all showbiz. Before I conclude this presentation, I will leave you with two audio clips. The first is an excerpt of an interview I did with Cat from the Supernatural Beatles YouTube channel. Cat is an accomplished pianist spanning 40 years and is also a music teacher, with three diplomas from three different London-based music colleges in teaching, musicology, and composition. During our show, I asked Cat her opinion on whether the Beatles wrote all their own music. And the second clip comes to us from Alan Watt, who was a long-term researcher into the causative forces behind major changes in historical development. For much of his life, he was heavily involved in the music industry as a singer, songwriter, and performer. He was involved in folk music, blues, pop, rock, and even classical. Alan Watt was also known for his session guitar work. He played with some of the most well-known artists and groups. And with that, my friends, that wraps up this presentation and thanks for listening. So I'm a music teacher now. I've been a music teacher for almost 23 years. But, you know, 25 years ago, I was still a student. And when I was a music student, I had to do a project for, I think it was popular music theory. And it was listening to and critiquing all of the songs in chronological order on all 13 studio albums of the Beatles released in the UK. It was a massive undertaking to actually analyze every single song on all of those albums in chronological order. And I got to the end of that project and what was immediately obvious to me was that they, it was absolutely impossible to me that they had written all of that unaided. Absolutely not. I thought, wow, the Beatles must have seriously had help. How did you come to that conclusion? What was the criteria that you applied to come to that conclusion? Well, you know, some of the music was too sophisticated. Some of it was harmonically too sophisticated. Some of it was rhythmically unlikely. Some musical devices that 
hadn't been used for hundreds of years were present in that music. You know, cadences that haven't been popular since the medieval period suddenly turned up. It, it was a mixture of things. Um, but I just thought that, well, let's stand back from it. I mean, I'm a music student. I'd done my grade eight when I was 14. I, you know, had a fairly good grounding in music theory, even as a student. And I thought, well, if I had to write this, what would I do? How would I have coped? And I would have struggled. I mean, you can say, well, they're very talented, but that only takes you so far. There has to be some underlying skill set to fall back on. And I just didn't feel that they had it. And then, of course, that the sheer volume of it, there's a lot of it in a short space of time. And then, of course, there's the fact that it varies wildly in terms of its quality. It's quite consistent in the first half. And funnily enough, it's actually after Billy turns up that it actually goes up and down. And I kind of think that some of it they were helped on and some of it they weren't, particularly when you listen to the White Album. And I mean, even, even uh, George Martin said they could have had a, one single really good tight album, right. but they chose not to. And that's, I think, because Billy wanted to have 33 tracks, but he didn't quite make it and he only got 30, <laughs> but only by including everything. So it was a whole bunch of different things, but I felt pretty sure just looking at it that they must have had help. You make stars in the music industry. Uh, I hope you all realize that and, and are, are mature enough to understand that. Um, we're presented as though someone some, just makes it and nothing is further from the truth. Stars are made and music is part of entertainment. It's like Tinseltown, it's the same thing. It's um, it's an entertainment industry with very um, with professional people running it behind the scenes. And so you can take anybody really and with the right song, the right promotion, make them into a star. But the Beatles came out of nowhere. No one had heard of them. And suddenly they were there every day. Uh, that took a lot of preparation to make that happen because the BBC at that time, remember, uh, there was but the only television station in Britain uh, was to promote them uh, from the very beginning and uh, and really push them. That took contacts, that took money. Uh, to get your name in the paper takes a lot of money too uh, across the world, or never mind the country. And the songs were so different. That they simply didn't tie in to the silly little songs that they'd been sung before that, the sort of boy-girl love songs. You know, the, the songs were different and the words were different. Um, it was not a back, uh, a backyard uh, or garage type band. There's no doubt about that. You looked at the music schemes, uh, the formulas in the music. You looked at the chording and that was not done by, by young men who only knew three chords. Uh, so, but they came in out of nowhere, heavily promoted. Uh, had one hit after another, and um, we know later on that Theodore Adorno, um, a very big player in culture creation for the world, uh, a man who came out of the Frankfurt School, who was trained, he's a professor, but he was a very intelligent man, um, trained in culture creation. He understood it very well. He wrote a few books on it, in fact. He had been a Trotskyite and he'd studied how to alter whole societies through the youth. And he wrote about it too. And he was brought in uh, to Britain and, uh, uh, and, and used by the British system. And, uh, and Adorno was a, a, an incredible intellect out of all the big players at that time. He was a, a tremendous intellect. If you read his books, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, he, he thought in German and he said that he couldn't uh, really convey the, the meanings of, of thoughts explicitly in English because English was inadequate. But um, he, could, he could write a sentence and expect his listener or, or his follower to read that sentence for a whole page without a full stop or a comma and never lose thread of where he was going. And he said, most folk cannot, cannot do this today. He said, man, not too long ago, could follow this thread 
can understand it completely without losing the thread of where the actual sentence had started and convey its thought right through. We've been dumbed down, in other words. <laughs> First of all, you've got to understand that pretty well all that culture out there today is in a state of flux, has been for a long time. It's in a state of flux by design. And we are given uh, these, these role models to follow, the songs even to follow. Uh, you understand most of them don't write their own songs, most singers today. And they can buy the titles and so on. They can buy the complete rights to them, but generally they don't write them. It's, it's, it's the, the guys at the, at the top who own the whole industry decide what's in, what's not in. And they're looking for certain lyrics and words and always with almost uh, subliminals in them, in a sense, uh, to do with sex and so on. I remember when it came down the pipeline, and it came down the, the, the grapevine, that uh, gender-neutral songs were now in. So you think that, that music is free. Music is not free at all. There's a lot of political correctness in there as to, as to what's going to be pushed. And if, you're, if you don't go along with it, your song is going to be um, ignored. And so you suddenly came up with all these songs, and you didn't know if they were singing about a boy or a girl. Well, that was a political decision. The ones higher up um, are all experienced in the sciences of sound and the manipulation on the human mind of particular types of sound, uh, the effects, the emotional effects it has on people, and, and also the words, the combination of words, uh, which can have a, almost a magic impact on young people who parrot generally the choruses, uh, and they vaguely understand or remember consciously the, some of the, the main verses, but uh, the subconscious really listens carefully and retains the, these subliminal, you might say, the, almost in the background uh, verses, and uh, they act upon it, they actually act upon it, programs them to act out, and they start to change their speech, they'll, they'll copy the little words, the new, new, neologisms, they call it, for new words, they start to mimic them. They don't right. know where it came from. They don't right. question anything. And so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, they had meetings in 1904 on this very topic, international meetings on the use of music. And one guy from New York who was experimenting with a new type of what became really jazz, not Dixieland jazz, but the more uh, sort of um, discordant type jazz, and he right. was kidnapped eventually after the Russian Revolution and taken over there because they, the Russians understood the significance of music on the minds of the youth. And, and uh, they worked heavily on this. They came out with the Beatnik era. That was a communist invention where they, they would uh, associate a particular uh, dress code, uh, type of music, and the use of marijuana for the West and use this kind of um, discordant music, which put you into almost a hypnotic state. Nothing really mattered. Anything would go. And, but it, and it took off really well in Europe, but didn't quite make it for the U.S. and Canada. So they had to go back and uh, revamp it and turn out pop music. Um, now, guys like Martin that worked with the Beatles uh, was really a scientist in acoustics. Mm. And, uh, and, the, and how it manipulated the mind. If you listen carefully to the, the types of arrangements and so on that were done in that early music, um, it was definitely done not by backstreet musicians or three chord wonders, but, but by people who really knew their, their stuff and how to get particular types of emotions attached to the words that they were putting out. 